All right, we are live. All right, uh, my name is John, and I'm here with Ben and also uh, Frederick Voltaire. Uh, what, uh, what was the last part of your name? I forget. Bastiat. Bastiat. Yes. Uh, uh, this is the. I don't know the the whole spiel. You want to go over the spiel, or just because it's something different? Should we just leave it off, Ben? That's it's up to you. So John's, uh, uh, yeah, sent out the message, and and he's actually I'll just let you do it. It's your one. You're running. Okay. This. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So this is this is kind of a an offhand type of discussion. This is kind of more. Uh, free freestyle interview. Uh, I wanted to talk to Voltaire just because some of the stuff he's been doing recently, and also uh, get give us a chance to talk about the Zizek Peterson uh, debate that they had recently. So, kind of have a large swath of different topics that we topics that we can go over. So, should be interesting. But yeah, so Voltaire, what you want to uh, give the people here just kind of a the main focus of your channel and Twitter and wh what you're kind of on about, uh, what, what you're all about right now. Let's see. I'm mostly all about politics and sometimes I discuss religion. If it's, if I feel like it's, I don't know, worthy, uh, best suited at the time, but, uh, you won't find me really talking about religion on my channel. I just mostly debate people externally, um, other people's channel, like uh, modern day debate and the non secretor show. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm just a guy who's mostly into politics and what's going on in the world of that, the world of politics. So. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Like, it seems like I, I, I know I listened to at, at least one of your interviews with a uh, libertarian author. It, how, how did how did you uh, man, manage that? Like, did you just reach out to him on Twitter or something like that to talk email. to him? Email? Mm hmm. That, it's so cool because I don't know. It's like some. It's a part of YouTube that has not really been uh, utilized to this extent yet. Because there's probably like a ton of different like smaller time authors and things like that that would be up for discussing their book just on just in these types of like reform conversations, things like that. And like not a lot of people are actually going about using this uh, using this platform to that fullest extent. I think. So it's really cool seeing you and like a couple others doing similar stuff uh, right off the bat. But um, let's see. So uh, I, I know you uh, recently sh appeared on the uh, non sequitur show and, and uh, we're trying to go over the the like religious history behind the cultural institutions that we have for government, things like that. Is that kind of what you're wanting to talk about mainly? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I don't know, it seems it seemed like they, maybe being less interested in that topic, kind of tried to gravitate you more to arguing for a different thing uh, of uh, the religious, like, backgrounds or, or the religious... The religiosities of, of the uh, various founding fathers for the American institutions that were in play. So I, I don't know. It, it might just be the uh, one of the side effects of, for that kind of platform, just because their show is primarily focused on the, I guess, contentious side of religious uh, re religious structures and things like that. With kind of the focus on anti-theism, things like that. So it might, it, it, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say it, it's a fruitless endeavor, but uh, to try to talk about religion from a more nuanced perspective on there. But I, I guess that doesn't really... Oh, shoot. I can hear... Sorry. I heard myself in, in the other stream. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. It, 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 is, is that kind of... I don't know, what what are your thoughts on on, on uh, your your stream there with them? My initial reaction, I thought I wasted my life with these people. Hmm. Well, I, I don't know if I would call it a waste of life. Maybe uh, at least a, a good learning experience. That that's what I try to focus on whenever make some types of things that I end up regretting. It's just to look at it uh, through the lens of like, 
okay, this gives me at least a good understanding of for what not to do in the future, maybe. Just um, one, I, one, I wanted to talk about European history. I didn't really want to talk about the founding of America. And plus, I made it, plus, I think I made it clear enough that the founding fathers themselves wanted a religious, a religious and moral people to maintain their Republican institutions. Hmm. And I think, I think I said this at some point during the stream, but I think they kind of brush it aside. And as you said, focus on the personal and the founding father's personal view on religion itself, like Jefferson being the <laughs> skeptic, uh, Washington being the pragmatist, John Adams being actually being a bit more religious than the others. And, um, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. Okay. So what was the main, like, maybe w what would you say is a good focus then for the European history and, and its relation to uh, religiosity? You have to, I think you have to study the product, the, the, the buildup to the Protestant Reformation and the, Counter Reformation and also to the point a piece of the piece of Westphalia to hmm. get a good grasp of how religion ultimately formed Europe, 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 your um European social evolution. You know? mm -hmm. and, and I don't know. This is something I, I've been. I'm I'm not well versed in, in history, but it seems like some some of the stuff I've been looking into. It seems like a lot of the like Enlightenment uh, thinking. It was kind of born out of this, uh, I guess, pr part of the Protestant, rev uh, uh, Protestant uh, uh, separation from Catholicism and, and trying to, I guess, more of the focus on individualistic thinking rather than maybe placing all intellectual authority directly into the, the Catholic Church. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, would you, would you say that's on or maybe off base somewhat or too complicated to simplify it to something like that? Well, it's a big, com it's a big complicated subject and we need to simplify things anyway to just get to the point that get to the heart of the matter of these things. So, but, mm -hmm. but basically you're right. Well, it's more so due to the fact that this fragmentation left, left Europe the vibe left Europe divided and also a bit more, a, a bit more violent, a mm. violent place. Um, some is actually, I think the Protestant Reformation is largely a result of the, the printing press, you know, Gutenberg. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's, it sort of just led to this like extreme polarization and violence. But at the end mm. of the day, it led to this fragmented but a bit more localized Europe this more a bit more pluralistic Europe like it put it definitely challenged the Catholic Church hold of all other countries like mostly around Central Europe countries like France Germany Italy Spain while England while England was and other countries mostly mm -hmm. in the uh, Northern Europe was a bit more Protestant, a bit more pra um, polaristic. Like, mm -hmm. allow the one of the best things from the Protestant Reformation because it, it allowed pluralism and fragmentation. It did lead into the uh, it did lead to more liberal, liberal, individualistic think thinking, which later accumulated to the Enlightenment project. But even then. They did justify, they did use the framework of a God. For example, John Locke was a Baptist and he, his political philosophy is entirely rooted in the belief of God. So mm -hmm. this is to say that, um, I could have said this on the stream, but overall the founding fathers were pretty much the product of the enlightenment. And that could explain their amb ambivalent views on religion. But overall, they did kind of justify their um, separation from Great Britain and their arguments for why they needed an independent United States under the view of God. And even then, like you see this in the Declaration of Independence and probably some of their more 
personal writings and personal correspondence. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know you're like your namesake Voltaire, uh, like him being a deist, there's this quote of him that like really the only quote I know of from him is that uh, if, if there were not a God, then man should be of need to invent him. It seems like that is maybe part of the uh, kind of the idea behind a lot of the enlightenment thinking is that there sure there's a deistic God out there or like we need some sort of idea of God for grounding say morality, like within Kant or grounding uh, God for morality for like human rights, different things like that. Uh, but it, it seemed like a, a large attempt to separate away from the more, I guess, top down structuralism of um, the, the church and the different religions that are out there just, I guess, due to their infringing nature upon uh, human individualism, maybe. But then again, like due to this top down structural nature of the Catholic Church, well, the Catholic Church professing a moral, a higher moral claim over the state itself, it did kind of lead to the development of the rule of law, you know, in your mm -hmm. European history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the thing. Like, even though it's, uh, even though there was a lot of like people from the enlightenment that were trying to get away from religions, none of them like were really trying to get as far away from religious thinking as like your, your I guess your other namesake there, Nietzsche, who kind of points out just how much even like human rationality and like science itself and, and the, the ways of even thinking about morals as being something uh, like we have to hold ourselves to. These are all kind of like byproducts of the religious mindset that we've had from uh, our, uh, I, I guess, cultural uh, institutions. Yeah, yeah, our in institutions. And like, e even like it still grounds the way we, that we think about these things somewhat. But yeah, it's, it's kind of like the Enlightenment figures. I don't know, maybe, maybe some of them kind of followed in the more... Uh, Nietzschean kind of dismissal of all systems of law and government, things like that. But well, with Nietzsche, he with Nietzsche, Nietzsche is always bring up should be bring up in these religious discussions, or at least in the history of Europe. And it's um, when it hit uh, when it entered its modernist era, um, Nietzsche just sort of just foresaw this. Uh, foresaw the death of morality, this death of a moral system, you know, like as he termed it, the death of God, that Europe lost its moral horizon and that we needed to replace it with something. That was mostly his epistemological project for the rest of his life to the point that he went insane. You know, that story, his story is kind of tragic and a little bit funny. Mm -hmm. Just... That's what. That's why Nietzsche is essentially important because he, due to the fact he was a much, since he was in a much higher place intellectually than anyone of any of us, he can able to perceive things and how things dif differently than us, and how religion ultimately made an impact on our thinking, and we, and he kind of wants us to escape because he saw it as a dead end. That's why he was all about the Ubermensch, all about value creation, since he viewed this as the greatest extension of human creativity. But mm -hmm. he also understood that human, he also understood human fallibility, that we, you know, we may have opportunity to seek value creation or create our own value system. This can lead to a sense of meaningless or a sense of delusions of grandeur, a sense of narcissism. And I think that's hap I think that already happened in the 20th century with the um, with the rise of these um new left people, this uh, new what we call now SJWism. Mm -hmm. This is more of a outshoot the outshoot of this um more therapeutic and narcissistic culture or this narcissistic system that we have right now. 
you know, as a result of that, as a result of the death of God, the result of the disappearing of a moral horizon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, like, <laughs> I've been like watching like uh, the uh, Mike Nana uh, documentary that has been going into the uh, the Evergreen situation, and, and it's so fascinating to see the hyper moralism within the uh, new left and, and the institutions that they're trying to put into place with uh, like these, like it, just by saying something that causes somebody to feel some sort of suffering or something like that, that automatically means that you cannot say that thing. And it seems like, at least from my understanding, a, a kind of born out of the utilitarian mindset of like maximize pleasure and uh, minimize pain. And so with that in, in mind, like anytime somebody experiences some sort of psychological pain or trauma, then they, uh, you're automatically in the wrong for causing that to happen. And I think also part of that is like how, like it, it, the way that people interact with each other is like trying to have a, I, I guess, rise up in the social, uh, so, social status hierarchy be, be amongst each other. And it seems like a, a viable method for, gaining like importance among your peers is by having some sort of traumatic past or by having some sort of disability or some other um something that places you into like a minority status so that you kind of gain that automatic um i guess social um boost for your uh for your status uh and and I don't know. It seems, it seems like it's such an easy way for people to like exploit the, the, uh, the moral system uh, of the kind of utilitarian ideas, uh, or it's not exactly utilitarian, but it's akin to that where, uh, you're trying to avoid suffering uh, for the individual, whatever, uh, in, in whatever way you can, as well as to, uh, help the, those that are marginalized by society. Uh, I don't know. That is something I, I, I've been thinking about it, regarding these kind of new uprisings of the, uh, yeah, the SJWism, I, I guess. And that I think we've talked a bit about before on maybe this channel. Yeah. But okay, so there was something you had said that I, I wanted to go back on to that was quite fascinating. You you're saying how you think that the like Gutenberg revolution was something that enabled uh, like widespread violence. Uh, I don't know, I, I want to kind of get more into that because I, I can kind of see where you're going with that just based like one of the books we read for this channel was uh, The Possessed by Dostoevsky. And kind of the central MacGuffin is this uh, printing press so that these uh, communists can uh, print their little pamphlets in, in order to spread their communist message. And, and basically the whole book is about how communism spread like a uh, mind virus, basically, like an actual good use of, of the term mind virus, causing, like, even influencing the actions of the uh, people that were, like, the hosts of this mind virus to act without even thinking. Like, they were pawns of the ideology of nihilism and uh, communism within them. Um, but I, I wanted to get, like, what exactly you were meaning by uh, that idea that you had brought up about the uh, Gutenberg revolution leading to mass amounts of violence. Well, earlier, a few months ago, uh, I spoke to someone who calls himself local desolus on my channel. And he read a philosopher named Marshall McLuhan. And he wrote about the global village and the impact of communication and effects of technology throughout his life. And, um, he sort of wrote the impact of instant, informa instant information or just the ability to read on a massive scale never seen before in humanity's recorded history. 
like we never really seen a educated peasantry or 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 educated people who were not who are not part of the nobility before and this sort of just start this um this mass violence just due to the fact that now they're reading now they're able to interpret these things they might want to break away from this uh, or dark or might want to break away this orthodox thing, you know, like from the Catholic church, realizing mm-hmm. that some of these things that they interpreted could be wrong. So they wanted to break away. So things started to fragment due to, just due to the fact that instant information, even in our modern times, we tend to react when we see the news, the 24 seven news cycle or see the news on Twitter, we tend to re- react pretty, pretty, Hostically, we react hostily, you know, mm-hmm. like we tend to have a really bad reaction. We kind of want to have this call for act, call for action. But now there's more. now there's mechanisms to stop us from doing that. But thank God for that. But that sort of just happened in the the in the Protestant Reformation that led to this mass surge of violence and polarization. And you can check out a clip by. British historian Neil Ferguson that goes over it a bit more better than me since he wrote a book about it called Square and Tower, I believe. Um, it's a really good clip. Uh, I recommend to check it out. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it, I, I can definitely see what you're saying about the kind of the Protestant Refo- uh, Reformation to the Catholic Church and especially kind of like the new system of um, what is it? exegesis uh, in, in looking at the Bible, like looking at the Bible in the same way that like we look at the, uh, it, we might empirically look at the, the rest of the world, like through a scientific lens. And so I can like the whole system of interpreting Genesis from a, like a historical account is very different from a lot of the ways that people were looking at it, like prior to the, the reformation. Like I think a, uh, the other, the early church fathers like August, uh, Augustine and uh, uh, some of the others, uh, like had the understanding that this was kind of a mythological uh, creation account. But yeah, it, it, I don't know. The, the it's almost like it, it places the entire ability to comprehend these types of very complicated things upon the individual like it it places the individual like it gives a certain amount of uh like recognition of the individual as being the 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 center point of the universe for like their interpretation is obviously correct in, in order to uh like placing such a high amount of like importance on on them which which i can see like how that idea has been very useful in being able to like widespread make science widespread. So like anybody can become a scientist. You just have to adopt a certain uh, methodology and like it, but yeah, it, it also kind of individualizes to such a great extent that it makes it hard for people to actually uh, come together in groups and actually agree on things together. Cause like if your interpretation of this thing, it comes in conflict with my interpretation of this thing, then like we're complete, we're each, we're going to like, just like the Protestants subdivide and subdivide and subdivide into these new like sex. And, and, and then there's just kind of like a, a new, new diversion off of the, the main, uh, field of Christianity day after day, something like that. I'd like to mention this is around the time religion became more of an emotional experience. Mm. It's a Protestant step, mm. like, and something that in a rigorous intellectual field. That's interesting. So, like, because prior to the Reformation, religion was more of a like a, a cultural. Uh, structure for for everything so like you would have the catholic church you would have the catholic uh government uh the catholic monarch different things like that all kind of all under the same rubric of catholicism and then with protestantism you kind of have your individualized like okay education is its own thing government is its own thing religion is its own thing 
and never the two or three should ever like come become interconnected with each other. Something like that. Sort of, but um, the sep- the idea of separation church and state goes back for a very, very long time. Like mm-hmm. it goes back to Augustine, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I heard that the. I, I guess that idea itself was like featured in the city of God. So it's, it's not like some sort of secular idea that has kind of been imposed upon the religious, but was rather uh, one, one of the, one of the uh, core idea from, I, I guess, one of the most famous uh, religious uh, books in the past. So that that's interesting. I haven't read city of God just yet, but it's uh, on my list. Hello friends. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. This is, uh, uh, Volt, he, he's kind of like a smaller time YouTuber slash philosopher, student, uh, polit- political expert, all that. And, and uh, yeah. How do you do? <laughs> you um, should be uh, introducing Tyler to Volt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry. Was, <laughs> the other yeah. way around. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. And this is Tyler, him and Bennett, and I have been part of this like what started a, as a Jordan Peterson group and then kind of moved itself outwards into right, just philosophy and book club and uh, practical psychology and all, all that type of stuff. So, yeah, welcome. I apologize for interrupting, but I'm yeah. always happy to help further this conversation. It's yeah, it, if either, either uh, you or Ben... I don't have, have a questions or... So it's you interesting you, you mentioned Marshall McLuhan... Um, Strangely enough, he was also a University of Toronto professor like our beloved Peterson, although I'm not sure to what degree they overlapped in circles. But uh, the medium of the message, uh, the, the medium uh, is the message. This is what he's kind of famous for in the information communication philosophy circles, I suppose. And this is, I think it's, it's strangely or appropriately redolent of Nietzsche and the comment of how the philosophy is a mirror of the philosopher. And this really important point, is, in fact, is the thing I love most about Nietzsche, his, uh, his insistence upon looking at the thing from which something springs, right, the source of it. And so when I look at history and the arc of it and the way that ideas change over time, I try to measure it now, I think, by the, essentially that the ideas throughout history are like a fruit and the or, or or a vine let's say and the fruit is the people that it produces so the the belief structure of any given time period seems to produce a certain kind of people and it's also intimately tied with the the geographical relationship the average climate right there's a certain type of behavior that occurs near the warmer latitudes versus a hardier kind of nature that occurs in the colder latitudes. Uh, there's a certain uh, looseness in the, the temperate and the tropical climates, right? These, these kinds of things uh, indicate how they shape the creature, right? And so when we look at today's landscape, we see what modernity is producing in certain pockets, what the environment, what the landscape is producing, what kind of creatures it's producing. So in the same way that you know, the oceans produce jellyfish and the skies produce birds, the modern universities are producing SJWs. Swimming about. Let's keep swimming. Let's keep swimming. Let's keep swimming. <laughs> so, I, I like your I, I picture, by the way. I love that, that uh, big bushy mustache of his. <laughs> yeah. it's a cool filter on it as well for the um a few points to chime in uh the i think we yeah we all know voltaire but i'm not sure other people picked up but i guess the frederick and also you the you mentioned the last name of it would be based that's frederick based the uh kind of the founder of libertarianism uh with his book the law right yeah sort of yeah so you can yeah combining the references for the Gutenberg uh, revolution point it seemed like both you and John went at it from different points which was um, the point you seem to raise was that 
the violence that kind of comes from the Gutenberg revolution, unlike what John said, where in Demons or The Possessed by Dostoevsky, it kind of came out through ideological indoctrination, uh, spreading that, when your point seemed more like it kind of more exploited human uh, tendencies, where now you're getting a input of information about things that aren't within your local proximity and more things that kind of as shadows that are controlling you. Um, so more things that you can't actually impact that then still exploit our human tendencies for want to resolve conflict and therefore causes uh, conflict through that desire. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I wish I was it's, articulate it's, as you. I'm a very important <laughs> speaker. Nah, you're, you're doing great. The, um, the, the other thing that's interesting about that is with the internet, there's graphs about political polarization uh, over the previous few decades. And then as soon as like 1995 hit, which is like when the internet started, the polarization between the American left and right just started expanding uh, way more. And there's pretty much no overlap now in the recent years. Uh, between the two and that seems like for the internet it allows people to kind of well also social media kind of creates these filter bubbles where we are fed information that we already agreeable to because that's where our attention will go and then it causes us to our confirmation bias to be exploited and then kind of props us to be more correct however um, so that seems to be part of the split, but then it's also tying into kind of both points about that Gutenberg revolution, the one about it exploiting human tendencies, as well as the point about a lot ideological indoctrination, because if one can summarize, uh, you know, the worldview and simple maxims uh, that is already applicable to people's temperaments, then that's going to be a lot more exploitative or receptive to their suggestibility for that worldview and then exploit them a lot more easily. Yeah. Yeah. And I think your, your point Volt is like highly relevant too, especially how like people are being fed a certain amount of information that are, is well, especially like with the news where like you watch one channel and then the primarily amount of news that's being fed into it, it, it is all about, let's say, like the, the outliers, like the most craziest and controversial uh, elements of the left, let's say, are being brought up and, and like emphasized uh, if you were to like watch Fox News or something like that. And then over on CNN, you, you might watch that and like the, there's a spin put to... <laughs> Uh, the, all, the the craziest uh, right wing voices and different things like that that are being put up and, and leading to the point where your assumptions are are just going like your natural assumptions that you're going to be uh, gaining from that is like just uh, self indulgent really yeah but also keep in mind um, you know things are polarized in American society as of right now. Mm -hmm. it's not as bad in the seventies or sixties hmm. uh, when you have, when you face with rapid political changes, since there's the civil rights movement and, um, and other, and the Vietnam war, that was a big uh, factor in the polarization too. But now we're just kind of just, we're kind of just sitting on a precipice right now that we can go back into the dark, the violence, or we can continue to, be on this rather moderate path where right now I think the crime rates are pretty low. I think they're back to 1950, the 1950s levels right now. Hmm. And political violence and assassinations in the United States are relatively rare and low, which is a good thing. Hmm. Just, just keep in mind things are not as bad as they appear to be, but only, but then again, things are still pretty bad from our standpoint. Yeah, it's like our uh, entire, like, by living within a uh, well-structuralized uh, uh, civil society, like, where we place contention upon it is in things that are, like, 
like 50 years ago would be like absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> like, like, like basically just gossip and like drama between uh, each other and things that have like no real actual. Um, yeah, this is, this is really interesting in our current era, right? Because, because we have access to all the tragedies, mm -hmm. all of them, every one of them. And like Ben said, they're, they're curated for us. And there's a, there's an insistence on this and it doesn't really matter why or what, but it is occurring. And it has a profound impact on our behavior and the things that we're interested in. <laughs> yeah, for myself, like uh, I practice this thing with YouTube where I have multiple different brand accounts for the different interests. So all of the news goes into like the Ben Drama account. All of the music goes to the Ben Music account. That way, like I don't uh, like I can isolate my interests based on what I actually want to watch at the time. And so if I watch like a music video, suddenly my news interests aren't, <laughs> aren't uh, taken over by, by uh, that music uh, style. But that's been quite beneficial because I have this band drama account for like subscribing to all these different news sources and whatnot. And uh, throughout like 2014 to probably 2017, like that's probably that channel probably has spent the most of my time there out of the nine channels that I have just watching the content around that. And then as soon as I really started, you know, as this uh, group that we have here, the Beverly channel uh, kind of took off and we got more and more interest in philosophy. And really since um, the big movies there would have been like Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil as well as Iran's. Uh, philosophy who needs it for me uh, they kind of uh, was able to draw me away from this uh, exploitative behavior of just watching more and more news and being afflicted by that because you watch like a Paul Joseph Watson video and you're just like outraged and you feel you need, you're like getting called to action about the end of the world is near kind of stuff yeah. and then um, and then once you start uh, kind of moving away from uh, that content and then developing your own philosophy, I think you become a lot less reactive uh, to this type of um, uh, exploitation that the news kind of plays onto your, to these dramas that you can't control because then you can't, you know, as you develop your own philosophy, you realize more and more the things you can control and what things are right. And you also kind of develop politics from philosophy. So you can then start to realize what's the ways to kind of influence culture and develop strategies for that that aren't purely reactionary. Right, right. So I, before I was rudely interrupted by my own coughing fit, I was trying to make the point that this, uh, I, was, I was actually speaking with a friend recently about, um, since we have Voltaire here with us, about Candide and the, the kind of merrily tripping his way through tragedy after tragedy in the world and this conflict with the sense of all things as they should be and whether or not you should work to fix them. And then at the end, ending up right in the garden, tending one's own garden. And this seems to be the experience that we're having right now. And, and this is, I, I think, exemplary in the rules that Peterson is trying to espouse, the ones he's trying to, to get people to follow, this notion of uh, putting one's own house in order, right? That, that really that the the chaos that we are confronted with is kind of it's like it's proximal right it's right around us it's localized but what we seem to be getting caught up in is these like massive concerns that we have no real control over but we're now emotionally invested in and that's a kind of madness right when you have this emotional investment with something that you have no control over yeah so this will be a good lead up that uh, Voltaire would be a great uh, answer for, which is that, you know, as at least for me, and I'm not sure how much of it is temperamental, but it's probably a lot. Um, but then again, I did have quite different temperaments and I went through like, you know, some significant life changes uh, around 2014 that really made me have to change my axioms and to some extent my personality as well. I became a lot more disagreeable. Um, so I think after that, because I kind of, my agreeable ways kind of allow me to be, ex be exploited uh, quite severely. And then, you know, I changed, became more disagreeable, became more assertive, then also kind of found 
uh, conservatism and libertarianism and then kind of had to balance that do the balancing act but in the end like i ended up coming to liberty and libertarianism as in my opinion and i like you know the the it seems to be like the superior political ideology just because it allows all the others to peacefully coexist within it mm -hmm. um whereas it seems uh from what i can tell is that there's most people it seems have this degree of self-righteousness where they believe that it is like say democracy the whole idea of democracy is to say that we're going to reduce we consider the idea of reducing individuals liberty for the group's desires to be a good thing and therefore it makes whoever win justified in their righteousness uh, because they are now elected to then reduce the liberties of the individual to the extent that in say for instance the american constitution allows those uh you know that has some restrictions like the uh the i am not sure exactly what amendments it is right like the freedom of speech the gun laws and whatnot there is some restrictions but then for countries outside such as europe or even Australia, we don't really have any explicit restrictions on those. And New Zealand is a good example of that, where as soon as the Christchurch shooting happened, then they kind of became like a 1984 style thing with the type of punishments, whereas like um, quite crazy. Yeah, what was um, it? Somebody got 14 years for sharing that video, like with the uh, ex expectation that like the person they were sending it to would add like some sort of uh, like kill count to it and, and different things like that but yeah it's still ridiculous like uh, it, it's it's just yeah. been, like but i like i can understand the personality like behind that like if you are more agreeable when you saw like some of the tweet reactions to that news story and there was a lot of uh more feminine types uh more agreeable types where they kind of like oh don't we shouldn't let hate spread or it's never okay to spread hate and then it's always hard for me because then it's just like, well, what about the military that protects you against hate? Like, like, or what happens when you have a disagreement with somebody? How do you win over that disagreement, right? Those things then can be perceived by hate by other people. So it seems like, you know, from need, like, so my question is uh, to Voltaire, would you consider like Nietzsche as like a lead on to libertarianism? And do you see libertarianism then, like, how do you see libertarianism fitting into philosophy? And then what challenges do you see? Because from my opinion, it just seems like a natural progression for us to, to go to kind of resolve a lot of these, these issues. I say Nietzsche was definitely, well, people are still figuring out what he's trying to say to the 21st century, but I don't think Nietzsche is a lead on to libertarianism. I think Nietzsche is more of a, I don't want to say anarchism or any really anarchist. It's definitely his, definitely his thought is a form of anti-politics. But with Nietzsche, I think he wants us to be more resistance, a much more stronger man. Just uh, give me a minute. We actually have a question in the sure. chat for probably you, Ben. Uh, Kandor Convos asks, does libertarianism have a good solution to the social media censorship problem? Sure. So, you know, the principle of libertarianism is liberty. Uh, and you can still do social censorship while respecting liberty, which is opt uh, by, what is it? By default, uh block the list that you are subscribed to by default. So for instance, everyone who signs up by Twitter, they're subscribed to a block list uh, that then is considered where by default, it creates a safe space for Twitter. So anyone who is more trolly, anyone who is more on the fringes of the okay. Overton window, they are subscribed in that block list, but then you can have a unsubscribe from that block list where you then say, hey, I want the full gnarly experience of the world, uh, which is kind of like switching from YouTube to Live Leak. <laughs> uh, yeah. That kind yeah, of but, difference, yeah. But still for like uh, the owners of Twitter, they, they have like 
through libertarianism, they have full right to ban and dismiss anyone that uses their platform, even if the primary usage of their platform by others is what's I don't know, akin to a public service or a good, or not a public service, but a public good that's being used or like a public yeah, what, form. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can get into that where it's, sorry, Bote. I'm back. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. We got off on a tangent there. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, are you familiar with Nassim Nicholas Taleb? Uh, yes, I love Taleb. Yeah. Okay, are you familiar with his idea on anti-fragile? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, I was trying to get into. That. I was trying to get into that. I, I think mm. philosophy can latch onto that more appropriately. Like, yeah, that... more resistance, almost stoic uh, view on our on ourselves. You know this. Yeah, that's good because like. Taleb is kind of the uh, mixture between both Nietzsche and like libertarianism because like he he very much is of the kind of uh, <laughs> like uh, almost a, a bit of like moral like all of morality is more so our own uh, I guess projections in, in some ways but like or or okay a, a better articulation would be like. Uh, don't trust what people say, like even what their moral presuppositions are. Uh, rather, like look at what they do uh, in order to determine what their moral values are. Uh, that, that's kind of part of Taleb, but also, yeah, it brings in the more libertarian kind of philosophies of like the uh, the silver. What is it? The silver rule. Like, do not do unto others what you do not want them to do unto you rather than the uh, golden rule or Kant's uh, categorical imperative uh, to, which is just basically the, the inverse of that. But yeah, I, I think just, Taleb is just, like such a great author. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Just just let me finish up on that question and then yeah, yeah. that point will be a great point to jump onto afterwards. So uh, yeah, so for the, you know, yeah, sure, like Twitter, uh, you know, as a private, well, even as any entity, they have the right to have consensual agreements with the users and the users can consent to being censored uh, to inappropriate behavior uh, or, you know, blocked from the platform. However, the again, the point of libertarianism is the value and the virtue of promoting uh uh that every human has a right to liberty, uh, the right to uh their person, their health, as well as the right to property. And whereas if, so censorship kind of violates that right to liberty. And and so it's a bit weird to then, you know, as a company to then be like, we're going to promote your liberty by removing your liberty, <laughs> but to actually talk on our platform. So I think when we consider like the goals of libertarianism and what specifically it considers its rights, then uh, the default block list or subscribable block list is a really good solution to that. The hardest challenges to libertarianism that I found is things like climate change, where it's like, because if climate change, you know, just to appease the different demographics here, I'll use certain terminology. So if climate change was correct and that it is human cause and that let's say, uh, you know, certain companies are more responsible than other companies, then would things like carbon taxes and whatnot uh, that be things that are compliant with libertarianism politics. And it seems uh, that's quite um, more difficult to answer because that would seem to be the case because as it would be violating the right to someone's person, their health, uh, by these companies then doing things that, you know, exploit, sorry, not exploit, but cause environmental de degradation. So that's a lot harder one to uh, tackle. But for the problems that libertarianism tackles well and easily, I think it offers really clear solutions that are well thought out. For the Nietzsche uh, point, where Nietzsche uh, kind of comes in, and the reason I think he's associated to libertarianism is, and, and as you said, the idea of like the Ubermensch, where he kind of says, well, if morality uh, is primarily intuitional, but we still have to eat in this world, and therefore we should kind of work to develop moralities, our own moralities, and take that responsibility upon ourselves uh, where they are hopefully consistent. Um, and that way, right, and that's very much one of the founding, uh, one of the preconcepts to to 
libertarianism, which is everyone has to then have their own philosophy to then express consent and be okay with that, which is because if you're just like a peg in the wind uh, or a leaf in the wind, then you're not going to even know what consent really means. It's a reason why we disavow uh, statutory rape, because even though it's consensual, we, we regard it as not having the agency required to, to express consent. And that way, uh, I think developing a philosophical outlook on life um, which is consistent and receptive to update, which is kind of where Ayn Rand took libertarianism, is a good, it is kind of the tie-in and, and the kind of modern refresh. I must say that uh, the discussion around classifications and labels like libertarianism and such, I, I really think it's a bit of an illusion. Um, it, <clears throat> I, I kind of see I see the world in from an ethical standpoint. There's there's like a, there's a few different versions of ethics. There's a an idealized version of ethics, a personal idealized version of ethics. There's a set of oughts that I know I should follow, right? But then there's the actual behaviors, which always fall short of that. Let's say um, so. There there's a mismatch there. Then there's also something else, or something like my perception of what my ethics actually are. And that's often skewed as well, right? We usually rate ourselves uh, better off than, than other people may rate us. So the, there are these weird versions of ethics that aren't quite the same. And, and they're never the same even from day to day. So for someone to say they're a libertarian, uh, I, I would say, what time of the afternoon is it? Have you had your nap yet? Have you eaten lately? Are you cranky? What time of the month is it, right? But there, there, there seems to be, uh, uh, this is a Nietzschean point, by the way, there seems to be much deeper, baser biological drive that influences our behavior far more than these categories that we label ourselves with. I think people are a little more fluid than uh, the, the kinds of depictions that we usually get in our literary analysis of historical context. Yeah, certainly like identifying as like a label, uh, is definitely problematic because it kind of makes you more ideal like an ideologue rather than like a a what do you call it a stoic practitioner uh, yeah. who is receptive of well of you become possessed by the idea when you identify with it yeah. right? that's that's the possession of the idea the Jungian idea and this is interesting there's a Jungian quote the the individual who has not discovered their uh, unconscious will be controlled by it and they will call it fate hmm. And this is a this is a perspective, right? This this perspective produces a particular kind of philosophy, a la Nietzsche. So the philosophy that you gravitate towards as someone who is weak, as someone who cannot cultivate their own garden, who cannot lift their own hoe, is going to be one tending towards mercy, let's say, and benevolence. And the one that is masterful and whose sphere of influence extends uh, beyond and you know to the, the the billionaire status let's say is going to be attracted to a philosophy that uh let's say is more associated with the the, the kind of prosaic view of nietzsche and will to power schopenhauer will to power all that right mm -hmm. yeah so at, at the same go ahead Bolt. Uh, nothing yeah, i was just listening okay at the same time uh for that right like people's temperaments should change uh well you know they rarely change but they do change when one's worldview is destroyed uh, mm -hmm. or, or irreconcilable so I mean, we should move towards uh ideas that are better ideas and i think that no one here is i like i know that I, i've been going back and watching uh, William Buckley's firing line interviews, and he's interviewing Moritama Adler you and too. Alice. Yeah, and Adler's yeah. been uh, saying um, <laughs> recently on, on one of them, he's just like, "Yeah, I do believe some ideas are better the, uh, than the others." And then uh, Buckley's like, "Oh, that's not a fashionable thing to say." No, it's just like, "Wow, even in the fifties, uh, uh, these." you know, this kind of stuff was going in. And it kind of gives you a lot more respect for Rand and how ostracized she was. Uh, well, yeah, uh, so Buckley was certainly of that class of people, uh, highly 
a highly specialized class of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I love yeah. those. I love those expressions. Those people, peoples, the peopling on the earth, right? Like even the ones that are so strange and weird and idiosyncratic. I love that. I, it's it's just like to me when I look out into the forest or the jungle. It's it's just like seeing some strange, you know, colorful butterfly or flower or some bloom. Um, I don't know, if it, but Buckley types are very interesting. Yeah, that a product of his environment, a product of his political environment of the of the Northeast conservative movement. Let's say. Reactionary yeah. in some sense, but yeah. I wanted to get what into your. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. J yeah, just one uh, more point, and then and then I'll shut up. The uh, yes. the Plato's Cave. PewDiePie actually uh, did a book review on uh, the Republic. Uh, and that was, yeah, Plato's Republic. And it was, he did a 40 minute book review and in it, he talks about Plato's cave, which is the idea that people, when they start off life, they're kind of strapped to these rocks inside a cave and all they witness is these shadows moving on the wall. And that's a reality. And then after that, then, you know, eventually they may break free of those shackles, constrain them to the rock. And then they see that their worldview was just shadows of movers and that's and then eventually they may end up going outside the cave and then discovering light and they're blinded by it um and then eventually they kind of have to now integrate with the the light and with uh you know the the 3d movement of the outside world and that's you know that kind of adds on to that statutory rate point as well as the nietzsche and ubermensch point which is yeah, we would be guided, um, like our intuitions guiding us, like the movers behind the shackles that cast the shadows. And then it's only when we kind of recognize that, that our, a lot of our political philosophy is kind of prone to this like self-serving bias and confirmation bias that we need to kind of start challenging ourselves to then develop something that is consistent and receptive to, the, to better information, which is where like Rand's subjectivism uh, seems to come in. Yeah, that's uh, like just from that uh, Mortimer Adler interview, he he mentions how uh, like Socrates was a like how as a, as a teacher, he wasn't like somebody trying to indoctrinate information into his students, but rather like go through this journey with his students so that it's a journey of discovery rather than a uh, like being forced into learning information or, or something like that it's like there's an active process in learning no, or like escaping from the cave really that's a great point yes because because when it's too frightening you pull away from it right like when you're not prepared to confront it mm -hmm. that is in fact i think like like much of what the body seems to do is constrain the information that's available and, and so our conscious experience seems to be this narrow bandwidth, extremely narrow. And, and, and a, in actuality, the, the, the becoming, the conscious awareness that arises in childhood is, is like just layer upon layer, right? Bit by bit, you kind of come to awareness. But it's, it's not like sudden. Things that are sudden, things that are shocking, like will blow your mind. They'll terrify you. Yeah. Right. And I think that's one of the good things of like one of the few things I, I like about Rand's philosophy is, is it, it goes in, it, it kind of centers upon that where somebody as an individual, you're not being like forced these ethical obligations onto you. It's up to you to agree to them or not. And, and like these are that way, it's not like you're accepting anybody else's ideas about how you should live your, your life. Uh, right. And are it's like, you're, you're doing this willingly and voluntarily. And I think that's like one of the good things about, uh, I don't know about Nietzsche because he, he didn't really believe in free will, but well, the psychological idea of choosing to do something rather than, this is probably much more uh, like Victor Frankl rather than Nietzsche, but to choose something rather than having the idea that, oh, I'm being exploited or I'm being oppressed by those in power. Uh, I, I'm. Yeah, yeah, right. But that ties back yeah. into your guys' earlier conversation about the Gutenberg press and that, that technology and that, that 
issuance into modernity is kind of what's led to this because what's what's happened is that we've been able to see the lives of others right we've been able to see the perspectives that were that were once hidden to us and mm -hmm. we've discovered terrifyingly that they are dramatically some of them are dramatically different yes and the current modern landscape the current political landscape seems to be that there are camps of people who are so completely terrified of the perspective of the others that they're unwilling to even engage in rational conversation with it or to platform them <laughs> which is that's a, that's a symptom that's a symptomatic behavior right deep platforming is is this unwillingness to it and i mean you know i see it also from the hemispherical perspective a la uh you know the the research from um yeah mick mick, uh, mick gilchrist, mick, mick yeah, gilchrist. <laughs> yes no no, no just... so you want to move on to the peterson zizek debate yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, there was the other uh, question from Ben that I, 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 I'm actually interested in your answer to. Like, what are your, I guess, main thoughts on libertarianism? Like, what, what sort of benefits are there for society in adopting it? And what are maybe like some of the shortfalls to uh, libertarianism that you're aware of, maybe? Oh man, there's plenty of shortfalls to libertarianism. I can't go into it on the stream. <laughs> but anyway, but. The thing about libertarianism, it does permit uh, ideological flexibility. It does mm. permit conservatism and even communism to that extent, <laughs> ironically enough. But it's um, on a societal basis, libertarianism at core is more about political pluralism. And at the same time, it needs to be tempered with a type of conservatism or a type of restraint so we can have this uh uh this this free society that Hayek spoke of in the Constitution of Liberty, right? That we need to have these ideas such as tradition to restrain us, but we also need to permit this idea of pluralism, dynamicism within our society so we can be strong and flexible and can overcome any challenges like to avoid uh political decay or just avoid a decaying state of mind or corruption and all that mess. No. Yeah. This is something I, I brought up in one of our other discussions. I think that like the, the fault I see within libertarianism, and it's not even really a fault, just like the limitations it has in comparison to other like political ideologies where it has no centralizing narrative for grouping together people like towards a certain goal or anything like that it's like each goal like the goal is only so that each individual has has the freedom to free freedom to go after their own specific goal there's no like larger focus for like purpose of humanity or, or uh, like what we're all going to be working together towards and so like even like with a libertarian philosophy over the entire nation there are still going to be the added, uh, like, or, or it's not, it, it, there's still going to be the people that do centralize or, or group together under some sort of like common morality or rubric at, that are more capable of having political action than, say, the libertarians who each have their own specific uh, goals yeah. that they're seeking out on their own without any help or, or without any. Uh, like sharing with, with anybody else, really. Yeah, that was a very well spoken, Voltaire. You, you're also quite eloquent yourself. Uh, the, no, the, I'm John, not. that benefit, <laughs> <laughs> but that benefit uh, seems uh, well. That's sorry. That kind of constraint of libertarianism is actually the benefit, which is you know if you practice it, uh, like if. Uh, it, it is practiced politically, like as a political doctrine, then it allows these subset groupings mm -hmm. within it. And that's a good thing. So like we would see different religions spawn up and we would see different ways of acting, like seasteading is like a good example of that. And to some extent, like that's why William Penn uh, kind of set up Pennsylvania as like this this experiment of of this more at that time progressive but but when they mentioned progressive there then it was more just respecting freedom of religion and freedom of association and you know that kind of made pennsylvania uh, a great success and and led to a lot of the the 
foundations of the American constitution and the discussions about what America should be as this more free and liberty oriented place than the more dogmatic UK at the time. And then by the UK running that experiment in Pennsylvania and then outwards, then it was able to take the best ideas back into its own country. But then to some extent, it seems like they're regressing with, with their ideas about liberty. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I think that's maybe the, the thing is like liberty is too vague of a concept to really uh, localize under because it's like yeah. liberty to do what? That's <laughs> kind of the question because there's yeah. like a lot of many different things that we do want the liberty to do. And there's also things that we want uh, the liberty or, or the lack of liberty to be able to do like for certain uh, drugs or or. Uh, substances that are actually harmful to us that make us more vulnerable to uh, be like our other aspects that we're wanting to seek after. Uh, yeah. It, it's kind of interesting. Like a, pr a president of a libertarian state, essentially considering people's nature and the majority of people kind of not wanting to become ubermensch, right? The majority of people wanting you know, some collective to associate with and to guide their orientations because it's more efficient that way uh, uh, would then become like this paternal, like this kind of paternal fatherly figure, but a good father, not a, the tyrant, but more like the mediator to kind of, because every all those group associations, the collectives un underneath would then be like, hey, take our interests more seriously. They're the devil, you know, we like they would all peg their self-righteousness against each other. And then that fatherly uh, figure would then have to do that fatherly role of then saying, sort out your disputes yourselves mm -hmm. uh, and try and mediate that peacefully and civilly uh, as well. And to some extent, that seems to be like the role of, you know, many of the original uh, presidents of the USA. But then as time has gone by, then larger and larger collectives have formed that then have swayed governments to more and more, uh, you know, where it's now polarized between this huge left and huge right conglomerates. Well, um, okay. so I think, sorry, if yeah. you weren't done yet. Oh, well, we could probably go into this point uh, forever. And, and as John and, and Voltaire show. <laughs> this so, is, well, this I'll leads into yeah. this debate, actually. This, okay, is, this is the point leads into it, right? So the, prior to, let's say, the, the, the full, uh, and I'm going to stick with America because I'm American. I'm looking at the history here. Uh, the, the full territorial expansion, those who were of a different ilk could leave and go somewhere else. But, but when, you, when you draw your boundaries very firmly and you establish your empire or nation, once you develop a people inside that are dramatically different than other people inside, and we're seeing this division occurring but primarily between the urban and the rural areas, let's say, that the, the difference of lifestyle, lifestyle is so great that their philosophies and perspectives are dramatically different. Once that occurs... You, you see these political rivalries begin to develop uh, with this kind of polarization. And it, and it, it becomes a fight over resources initially, right? Because it, it, that's what we're fighting over is the allocation of resources. And it's this question of control about who has control over those resources. And that is the communist control, centralized control from a governmental perspective versus the more libertarian free market concept of uh, personalized, self-centered control. Although, since we're kind of heading into Zizek and Peterson debate, we should be conscious when we talk about Marxism or Zizek, he's a more of a Hegelian thinker in the first place. They have a more different conception about how things are and how things ought to be. And yeah, so I was... I, sorry. I'm saying that since they kind of talk about happiness or the state of human condition of satisfaction or whatever, I think Zizek is coming from a perspective that our social economic system does, does make people feel alienated, does make people feel unhappy, just like they're sort of just deprived of their creativity and their potential. That's more of a more materialist, a more materialist perspective. While Peterson 
doesn't really take a look at the system itself. It's just more so take the look at you at the individual and what are you doing with your life day to day. And they, the interesting thing about the debate was that they kind of agree that happiness is kind of a specious term. But at the end of the day, I think they did understand each other and do agree with each other that happiness is a byproduct of an experience and what is currently people what currently I just think the main disagreement lies in what's making people more discontent with with their lives and with this world. Um, because I think Peterson just take a more decentralized individualistic approach while Zizek just took a more Are you discontent? Uh, my profile is Nietzsche, so maybe I am discontent. <laughs> See, this is interesting. This is a good point, though, because Nietzsche was such a powerful intellect, right? So phenomenal to see so well into the future, and yet so fundamentally absorbed by, like, the feminine, right? By, by his wrestle with the feminine. And it, it absolutely shaped his perspective. Mm -hmm. And and I think this is so important. Like we like, I think most most of us grow up thinking that the rest of the the world sees the world the way we do, very similar to it. But it seems like the perspectives are so dramatically different. The difference between somebody who's living on the street, who's never had anything, or the person who is transgender, and the person who is living as a billionaire is such a dramatic difference that their worlds are impossibly uh, unintertwined. And have they have you, no language to share. Right? Have you read the book The Outsiders? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, with the, with the, you know, with the kids and the socials, and you know. Yeah, there's a movie with like Tom Cruise when he was real young, uh, in, in it. It was about, yeah about the gang of greasers basically, and uh, oh, it's been a while since, so I can't remember the exact plot to it. But well, but, I so I see history. Oh, oh were you gonna? I'm just saying that on your point, to expand your point here, that everyone of a different class or different standing have their own set of problems and their own set of discontent, like depending on their background, right? And yes. Exactly. I, and I think that's the nuance. That is that is the nuance that's missed ultimately in the argument most often. And I see it from uh, maybe an evolutionary perspective because... You can look in the jungle and you can say, you can look at a particular species of lizard, let's say, that likes to hang out on a particular type of tree and eat a particular type of insect. And those lizards which stay on that tree are privy to more insects because the insect perhaps likes that tree more. But if they stray, if they go somewhere else onto another tree, there won't be as many insects. Now, the environment, the total marketplace, let's say, the economy, the political landscape is the entire jungle. But the relative success of the individual organism is defined by that small little territory within the full landscape. And usually what seems to be happening is one individual like a Marx or a Nietzsche is looking at the whole landscape and attempting to plan the whole jungle around one or two specific types of species rather than letting the, the free market explode in diversity and letting the species inhabit each ecological niche on their own. Right. Yeah, that, that might this, be an interesting... This, oh, sorry. Go, you go ahead, Ben. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so this touches actually on our... We recently on this channel, we discussed uh, The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker, and he kind of argued oh. how the progressive mindset... Um, or he calls them kind of more blank slate as is kind of hedged on this idea of the blank slate that people are nurture determined and that the ghost in the machine. So the idea that free will uh, is present uh, and what was the other one and the noble savage, which is that corruption is due to social causes, nurture causes rather than inherit. And then if one believes those things then. And, and to tie on to what Tyler just said, it makes sense why, uh, you know, for to adopt Marxism, 
right, to kind of adopt this global government, then you need to have axioms that are based on a blank slate uh, worldview, which is that people can become malleable to fit within a global community. Uh, whereas if you, like if people are innately different, which is the fiercely opposed by uh, progressives in Europe and America, then uh, then that type of global harmony worldview uh, wouldn't be as possible as one would see. And it's kind of funny then because it's kind of like this global harmony is both what the the communists as well as the libertarians are kind of after, whereas the, <laughs> they're just going about it in different ways. Well, just... Where are the communists and the liberal converge that they both agree that they want the flourishment of human reason and human development through, well, through largely through largely justifying through economic language and economic means? That why they communism be a more of an evolutionary stage that is going to happen, or something else entirely those but i just sort of just i with me i kind of need to spend my time sort of just understanding where these um marxists and anarchists are coming from because they do come from well i don't know where they come from that's why i'm trying to understand it but they do come from a more a place they do come from a same place of discontent as we were just talking about though just that they know there's something inherently wrong with it. Just, just, um, just yeah. two different. Well, just... well, so if you take if you take a mind that likes to analyze and map a control structure on top of, let's say, like an engineer, right, and then you uh, make them very conversant with uh, philosophy and politics and sociology. And you, you, you can you can almost guarantee that their mind will kind of produce a system of control. They they just kind of do this. This is like what Marx did, right? It just kind and of pair it with uh, two hundred thousand dollar a year salaries. Wow, <laughs> there is incredible homelessness in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you end up with a huge guilt complex. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and, and and so that's it's it's interesting. It's like. Um, I think it's what Christ called missing the mark. It's the, the, what the Jews were doing was missing the mark in some sense. Uh, that, there, that there was an essence to a law. There was an essence to a philosophy. There's an essence to being. And I think maybe that corresponds to something like the, the, the ground of the Maslow's hierarchy before we start getting into the muddled ideation, uh, self-realization parts. But the, the, the parts that are, that are real and true, like you have to eat, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to have shelter. And and beyond that, it starts to get it starts to multiply in its weirdness now, especially in modernity. Um, that what the, what things can be existent as like resources, what we can trade with, what we can communicate with, our language capacity has blossomed, exploded, right? But we've we've now gotten to the point where the the worldviews are so completely different that we are sharing completely different languages, like even the same words have different meanings that's something that uh one of the weinstein brothers is bringing up i think he calls it russell conjugation now um that, that you can you can choose particular words based on the framework that you know will it will produce in the mind of the person who hears it right yes but there's also just an underlying a underlying um epistemology or geonology to this um to our world because worldview and how things sort of just evolve and overset itself. It's just our language is just more of a expression of that. So. Well, that that's true. But again, like I could, I could ask anyone, so I could talk to someone, let's say they're diehard libertarian, right? And I could ask them a question. I could pull them in the morning after they've had breakfast, after they've had a workout and their mind is fresh. And I could ask them a question that a libertarian would answer in a libertarian type way. And then I could do that same poll with a large group of libertarians, let's say, to, to deal with really statistically in the afternoon when they haven't had, uh, let's say, a nap that they're used to or they haven't had a meal lately. And the studies show that people's political views and other ideas just shift because of their their current status, their health and well-being. Right. And, and, you know, this, you know, this anecdotally, everyone knows this when someone's cranky 
right? Yeah. Every parent knows this when you're raising a child. Right? Yeah. And it profoundly Jonathan, alters the way you see the world. Yeah, Jonathan Haidt brings up a couple of examples in his book, The Righteous Mind, where uh, you have people that would maybe be more central or, or centrist or maybe even liberal. But when you test to read that book, that's yeah, a, thank you. Yeah, it's a good one. When you test them, uh, like give them political questionnaires or something like that, when they're in like a messy room or like where there's gross things around or like even like there's a hand sanitizer dispenser somewhere nearby, they're going to answer the questions more conservatively just because these are all kind of like, I guess, primers for, for like why, why conservatism and like, because that's kind of the thing he, he brings up is conservatism is about getting rid of the disgusting things, like getting, like being sh sure to protect that which is held, uh, that is considered sacred or uh, pure, right? <laughs> and, and, and then getting rid of whatever is a threat to that. So, so I want to propose that this is all a big illusion. It's a big game. And I want to give the metaphor of the Colosseum of, of the Roman games, okay? Because I, it, I think it's very much what's going on here. Because I, I think no matter how people define themselves politically, whatever, there's fundamentally a human experience that overlaps to an extraordinary degree. And most of us can agree on these big, big, straightforward questions about what it is to find happiness. It has something to do with access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of those things that produce happiness around that, right? And I just lost my train of thought. And you have beautiful yeah. thoughts too. What's that? You have beautiful thoughts too. <laughs> oh. oh, I, I can Thank see you. where where you're kind of going though, with like this being kind of a game. I, I see it. Yeah, a lot I, I, like, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. I knew. So, so that's exactly what's happening right now. It's exactly what's happening. There are people as there always have been, who are in control. They're the feudal lords, right? They're the remnants of the feudal system that still exists now, the ones that prov by, they provide jobs and health insurance, right? They give you territory. It's a, it's a feudal association. It's a serfdom. Um, you even call them your boss, right? It's, it's the exact same relationship. Anyhow, there are those people that are, that are existent in all situations, it seems like, politically, and they need control structures in order to provide structure to the hierarchy underneath them. And in our circumstance now, politically, it seems very much like communism and <clears throat> capitalism or left and right are being set up as gladiators in an arena of combat that we're all supposed to cheer at and choose sides for, right? That seems to be what's going on right now. If you look at the landscape of YouTube and the landscape of the the, the political uh, blogosphere, that's what's happening. It's It's teams of people cheering for gladiators competing like you see it on the stages the very arenas yeah. that we set for them it's crazy yeah i think it's something to do with like we want to see our own like representatives going out there and defeating the people that we consider our enemies and yeah. so like we want to see it like there's a bit of projection there similar to like how you might get from watching a movie or something like that that you identify with the central character and you want want to see them win. And so we heighten these people up to be these kind of central figures that are out there in the public space, kind of uh, e extrapolating on these ideas that we have. We share intuitions with, but mm -hmm. they are just more eloquent at uh, bringing them forward and like owning the libtards with <laughs> them, different things like that. Yeah, and, and one part of the population is cheering as Zizek deftly mm -hmm. wields material dialectalism or whatever the hell you want to call it. And then, you know, the other half is cheering as Peterson uh, parries it with some kind of like uh, Jungian metaphor. And, and like, that's all that's going on there. That seems to be it because yeah. most of those people don't have a coherent unification, right? They're, they're all just kind of there yeah. enjoying a spectator sport. Yeah. Yeah. Helen, uh, uh, well, I've, a friend of mine, Helen, she uh, she went to a Peterson event, and um, uh, she's pretty switched on politically and philosophically. And she um, kind of observed that it was similar to my experience when I went to a Milo event a few years ago. Like the crowd is very 
um, kind of like Milo exhibits it. Uh, and I'm not saying Peterson does, but Milo exhibits it where, you know, that minute of hate from 1984, where it's like kind of sets up an enemy and the crowd cheers. Whereas uh, I haven't been to a Peterson event, but apparently, you know, there's the same kind of like lost child that Peter Pan is really, sorry, that Peterson's really appealing to, this kind of Peter Pan lost child. And then Peterson's kind of promising direction and that works uh, for a lot. Like, you know, it can be like something to set you on the right path, like a little old wise man on your trail in the hero's journey, yeah. right? But then eventually, like, if you just trust completely in that, then you'll get disenfranchised when, because if you've delegated your agency to a leader and then that leader isn't exactly what you want, um, then you'll get become disenfranchised. And to some extent, like, this is a lot of the political... Uh, issues with, I think, probably the non-voters where they kind of view all the leaders as not representative of themselves and they don't vote. And this is something that is quite uh, good and bad at the same time. It's good because it kind of shows that there's a need to drop the left-right uh, dichotomy uh, because it doesn't seem sufficient. Like we're still talking about like these political positions that were significant 100 years ago. But then these days, like we need to get more nuance with our application of principles and be like, is this principle better in this situation? Ben Shapiro is really good at doing that, even though he still has this overarching conservative philosophy, but he will challenge things on different issues. Um, well, I think I, that was my, my I point. Think, I think it might be a deeper yeah. issue than just a few hundred years history worth. I think this may actually be much, much deeper because it seems to be, it, if we kind of merge into it from a physics perspective, or even the, from an epistemological and ontological perspective, it, it's, it's all tied down to a, uh, this framework of internal locus of control versus external locus of control. It's, yeah. am I in control of where I want to go? versus is something else in control of where I, I can go, essentially. Yeah. Right. And it's There's also hard, right? Because, sorry, because uh, when, uh, like, say, for instance, the concept of white privilege, from my understanding, uh, I never knew what that term referred to until I started listening to more Silicon Valley white males talk about their worldviews. And it's very much like you can be, do, have anything you want, and it's completely inapplicable to those who have had undue hardship in their lives uh, because anyone with undue hardship knows that you can't be do have everything you want because it's based on your your economical constraints your attitude constraints and all the other things mm. um and so it's quite infuriating for these uh uh you know uh underprivileged uh people if you know to use that terminology um, to hear, you know, these, you know, the successful Silicon Valley white male, you know, talk about things with such ease of acquisition. And so my point, uh, there was, what was the point? The point was, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, in, in that situation, we kind of talked about how as well, they have these high salaries and there's a lot of homelessness in San Francisco and whatnot. And it kind of, but it's a consistent environment where these tech companies believe in kind of technological superiority and, uh, you know, that tech branch is all governments and, you know, this kind of worldview that if you want to change society, do it through technology. And it's con a consistent wish that is shared to people. And then they have an exponential gain, exponent, like infinite scalability and need to scale, and therefore they have to have a limited workforce. So that's another incentive to believe in the blank slate, because if you need to scale, you need to be able to hire everyone. But if you've already maxed out the talent pool, then you need to believe you can change people to become talent that you can hire. Uh, and, you know, there's a big push to get kids into programming, but, you know, for, uh, you know, with experience with children, uh, it horrifies me to push someone who would enjoy being a tradie to programming or someone who would enjoy you know other things to this this job because it's kind of like the same type of thing of in india there are a lot of movies in bollywood actually about trying to push kids to become programmers when they actually mm -hmm. wanted to do other things and it causes a high suicide rate that's um, what stem so has the, become 
That's exactly what STEM has become. It's it's a cancer now in education because it's it's transplanted the, the very notion of what it is to become educated. It has co-opted the educational industry to create, it's, it's nothing more than molds for the wider economic engine, right? You now insert yourself into a particular mold so that you can get squeezed out the other end so that you can be economically viable to a particular sector of industry. It's not about, it's no longer about uh, educating your mind and teaching you to think and so that you can look at the broad, uh, you know, marketplace before right. you even choose intelligently about which job to actually get. No, you're getting funneled. And it's not just a little funnel either. It's a deep, long funnel. It's four years. It's six years. It's eight years. If you can count right. like even younger, it's 26 years sometimes. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's only like half of the coin of the Brave New World strategy, which is get everybody to do the same jobs. But in Brave New World, they made everybody the same in temperament, yeah. whereas they don't do it in real life. And that's why we see shocking results. But well, they're, they're the trying. point there is, yeah. Yeah, so the point uh, there is kind of like, it kind of creates that proximal re reliability to then project you know, the company's wishes or the worldview wishes onto the world. So they have approximate situations that causes certain experiences that are shared. And that kills as a political framework that is shared within that uh, locality. And then they kind of have these wishes and then mistakenly project that onto everybody else. And mm -hmm. then this is, you know, but it can allow this delegation to politics very easily because of that, uh, uh, her, her, uh, her, Hegemonity, hegemony, uh, uh, you know, within that group. Whereas, uh, as Rand points out in philosophy, who needs it? Uh, you know, people are kind of just blowing in the wind until they develop philosophy to then make them actually confident. Because one of the things that is common in the tech world is the notion: I don't know anything. I treat all ideas as if they are equal, right? And, you know, anyone who studied philosophy, I think, uh, yeah. realizes that terrible. <laughs> well, it's, um, it, it's a profoundly left hemispherical point of view. It, it, it lacks the texture of value that exists in the right hemisphere. Uh, the, uh, the kind of mixed uh, blurred lines and associations of the broadly connected regions in the right hemisphere where we kind of live in the artistic realm, right? People who live in the purely logical programming, like self-structured, uh, very masculine realm, they, that, that's exactly how they see it all. They, they, they consider themselves these like, like data from Star Trek, right? Like these purely unbiased observers of the world, we see uh, rational observers. And that, that was the argument that was occurring between Peterson and Harris, right? Because Harrison's is kind of the epitome of that perspective, that highly left-brained, highly analytical uh, viewpoint. And that that actually ties back into the Hegelian dialectic that I, I do see the hi historical perspective in that way. It, it is a conversation. And strangely enough, I think that's kind of what occurs in the creation of new nation states. It seems to be like the, the, the creation of uh, a thesis uh, which is the initial uh, colonization, let's say the initial nation, and then the is the an antithesis in the colonization process. Like the United States was kind of the antithesis to the the thesis of the of Britain and the the original monarchical feudal control, and then the synthesis is now this process that we're occurring now. And and from the Jungian perspective, the 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 postmodern analysis right now, I think, is like the shadow is rearing its head. That's what we're being dominated with is these uh, underlying aspects of society that deal with the fundamental nature of what it means to be a, a living conscious creature. And I think that is masculine and feminine, internal control, external control, right? It, it's something that you see being played out across the whole diverse realm of, of, of biology. It's this constant interplay, especially in the sexes you see between larger female size, smaller male size equal size, right? Like one consumes the other during intercourse, or maybe you have mating pairs for life. Like you have this huge range and it's always this struggle, this balance of power. It's the yin and yang symbol, right? And, and that's, 
if we can just see the world from that perspective, I think, and that would be our, our base layer, that puts us on a platform where we can accept other people that see it from that same platform. And I think what's happening right now or what we're missing out on in our, our broader political conversation is that not everyone sees it that way and that some people see it dramatically different and you will not necessarily be able to ever have a conversation or live with those people as they are. Right. So to, to go to the historical process, I think, and hear me out, I think the United States should have a new antithesis right? So we should like, we should squirt California out as a new baby and cut the umbilical cord, right? And see what happens. Yeah, so you want, so you want California to see so it can fail? Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened, but I, maybe not. Maybe they will mutate into some strange, uh, improbable creature like the platypus who knows oh god right? it, it'll be the uh from the animatrix the initial machine world <laughs> and then the world that all the conservatives and the rest of the world smother the world in darkness to stop california <laughs> i think it, it's probably more like uh is it tetsuo is it it's tetsuo at the end of akira i think it's more like that we just become this giant cancerous growth that tries to turn and consume the entire universe <laughs> quite the antithesis there <laughs> well I, that's just i guess that's my view of california right now it just mm. that's the way i see their their uh their politics that's the way i see their economy that's the way it's kind of functioning they're 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 doing this rapid inhalation of immigration right and they're doing that for very underhanded reasons eric weinstein talks about this a lot they're doing it for cheap labor reasons, right? It's ridiculous. It's the most ridiculous uh, underhanded sleight of hand argument I've seen in politics lately. The whole, oh, poor immigrant conversation. It, it's in reality, they're just trying to pull in cheap labor. They even say that, uh, but they don't let people understand. That's like, it's such a strange thing to be doing that they're, they're not offering them something important or meaningful in life. <laughs> they're just trying to, yeah. I mean, it. Anyhow, it, it fits nicely into the conversation of communism and capitalism and how that labor gets manipulated. Yeah. It's also for the yin yang aspect, uh, this is part of parenting as well, which is, you know, a libertarianism does not work when the child is under 10, <laughs> especially <laughs> when the child is under 10, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, and if you practice it for the child when they are under one, you've got a dead kid, right? So the, uh, <laughs> The, so that's kind of like that yin yang when like but the goal there of that paternal uh figure there is to create liberty within that individual to create a civil independent adult to, and peterson just calls that adulthood which is our job is to create adults not adolescents who are by age adults right yeah so i i, I think that's a great way to define it in fact so so youth is or or, or childhood is something like potential and adulthood is when that potential is realized into a form that it can successfully navigate the environment that it's in. So when you're a mature lizard, you can successfully run up and down the tree that you're supposed to be on and eat the lizard's uh, food that you're supposed to eat. And that's but what it means. But they're dumb rocks, though, so why would anyone want to be a lizard? What's that? <laughs> Who would want to be a lizard? <laughs> I, I don't know. My, my kids have been playing with uh, animals a lot lately, so they're on my mind. Um, but then but, again, lizards are like dumb as frogs and they don't even recognize their own kin. Okay. All right. So that's true, right? That's true. But when you catch a lizard and then, and then let it go, I, f I have found more often than not, many of them will stop before scurrying off and turn their head in a strange little way and look you over. Like they will stare at you as though they recognize that you could have crushed their life, but did not. It's a very, it's, I, I, I mean, I know I'm crazy for thinking that, but it seems that way every time. There, there are many creatures that would never do that, right? Like you catch like a million mammals and they'll just scurry off, catch a fish, put it back in the water for the shock. But, but lizards do this really strange thing where they, they seem to stop when you let them go and look back at you. It's very odd, but it, th th this is some um, anthropomorphizing. <laughs> I, I, okay, well, so this is what's so strange about anthropomorphizing. Assuming the uniqueness and specialness of humans, 
uh, and that we cannot anthropomorphize is saying that we could never have developed ourselves some in some sense, right? So me anthropomorphizing is recognizing that what I am and how I experience the world came into being at least once in the animal kingdom. Therefore, some yeah. shade of it or echo of it probably exists in the other yeah. realms. The other but crazy aspect true. of that is is also that you know we we've kind of got this assimilation of components that exist elsewhere in the animal kingdom, and then but other like other animals have superior aspects uh, to the certain components that we have, such as eyesight in different animals is superior to our eyesight. So it's kind of interesting that where you could imagine the same thing to be for empathy, where like certain animals may have superior empathy. Uh, to us and and so like for an ant system like I wonder whether or not we would if we anthropomorphize like anthropomorphize that that may be like superior empathy because they all balance themselves in this perfect communistic way <laughs> so yeah well it's not perfect though but it's see it's not perfect when you look closer you see infighting when you look closer right. you see ants killing each other right doing little battle down down in the dark tunnels that nobody looks at they kill each other right there's there is all sorts of stuff that takes place like that we never notice but we, yeah, we notice right. now because we've got the most powerful observational apparatus ever in history of science so yeah th I, I think this kind of fits in with your yin yang uh discussion how i i feel like there's kind of these two contradictory i, I guess meta worldviews that we have for like the entire cosmos really. And one is kind of more, uh, let's say feminine based around personality and peoples and uh, character uh, agents with intentionality and, and things like that. And then uh, this is kind of like a, a uh, metaphysics of pantheism or animism or, or something where the world around us is living really. And then these, there's the kind of like, I guess, dichotomous end to that, which is very much the, the world is dead and inert and able to be controlled. That is, let's say, more, I, I guess, more masculine. Uh, just to dichotomize those two in the, I guess, Jungian uh, gender distinctions between them. Uh, and and uh, there's this, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, Dr. Kelly Clark, uh, who's uh, he, he did this uh, video called I Is Atheism Normal? And, and he kind of discusses how there's this distinction between um, uh, I, I, I guess the, the theory of mind. There's, there's the way where you can over attribute theory of mind towards everything, or you can under attribute theory of mind towards lots of things. So, like, uh, those uh, on the spectrum, uh, on the autism spectrum, they have a much lower, let's say, sense of other people's intentionalities or like what they're signaling with their facial expressions, things like that. And then there's kind of the polar opposite where you might assume like intentionality behind certain actions that were just accidental from another person. And I don't know, I, I think by having like both of these dichotomous worldviews occurring at the same time, and then working together with somebody else that also has that, like like a marriage between the, these two worldviews, it, it gives us great, a much greater capacity than if we were to adopt either one or the other. Uh, so is atheism normal? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the uh, lecture by uh, Dr. Kelly Clark. It, it's a really fascinating. Uh, lecture. No, no, I'm just asking a question. Is it normal? Oh, uh, well, from his, uh, I, I he. From his studies, he, he seems to find that atheism is much more prevalent within men and also uh, with people on the spectrum. So, uh, so just kind of, just kind of mixed bag then. It it could be partially like a, a sort of. I don't, I don't want to go any into it any further, just because it's been a little while since I've seen it. But and. Right there's probably a, a good deal of bias within it as well, but it seems, well, one of the things where people feel a compulsion to believe in God is when life's 
burdens become too much to bear with your cons your own worldview or philosophy. So you have to reach outside to something beyond you to then justify actions or beliefs. Whereas the more disagreeable you are, the harder time you have with forgiveness because you associate more agency to yourself. So it could be uh, that could be part of it. Where you, but the autistic spectrum that could be also more logical. Uh, orientation towards thinking perhaps I'm not sure I'm not that mm -hmm. specific on autism right but then like that those two things combined could probably lead on to that because the like I'm atheist but then I engage in I guess religious beliefs uh, or entertain their thoughts when facing certain conundrums that require faith to act so for instance and like say of marriage, uh, you know, what is the doctrines of marriage from a secular perspective? And it's very hard to answer that, especially, you know, one could say, well, to have children. But then what happens if, you know, one of the partners is infertile? What do you do there? What do you happen when one of your partners becomes disabled, right? Or has an accident? Like, you know, what are the clauses and the tenets of marriage? And, you know, that's practiced differently in different societies around the world and how they delegate those things and kind of there's a religious uh, base on that. So it kind of, um, at least that's my wishy-wash uh, uh, add to that. I'm sure there's some professors out there that have got a lot better answers. So, yeah. Okay, well, let's try and get back onto the uh, Zizek versus Peterson uh, conversation. Uh, like, I, I don't know, maybe if we could, uh, like each of us uh, go into our like main core thoughts maybe for it or, or uh, I don't know, or maybe even just like what we think of uh, a summary for, for the event was as well. Uh, maybe also just because I'm not sure how many of all of us have actually uh, seen, seen the debate itself. I, I, I have. Yeah. It seemed I, like, um, like a bit of judo. It's almost like a nothing of an event occurred, actually. That's what it seems like to me. That's why that's that's why I brought up the concept of the illusion now, because it seems more apparent now more than more than ever. Right. So it, it's uh, the great battle between communism, <laughs> individuality and collectivism is just this ghost of a nothing of an argument on the stage. Right. It's there's no heat in it. There's no vitality. There's nothing real there. Right? Just these old, tired ideas that have no real connection with, with the way that people are maneuvering about in their ordinary lives are getting lost up in these other crazy ways that, that it's just the spectator sport. Mm. That's what it seemed like to me. You're correct. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but that's at least how it seemed. Hey, yeah. don't say hi to John real quick. Sorry, kid. I, I had to corral the kids earlier, so I missed some kinds of it. Russell really wanted to say hi. Say hi to John. Say hi. Mm -hmm. Hi. Okay. I can't see you. Yeah. Oh. So, I don't know if that's me or not. I don't have her. But I can't see me either, even though I turned on the camera. Uh, do you have the... Uh, Can you... Yeah, and adjust the bandwidth settings, so there's the... Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got mine in audio only. Yeah. So, all oh, right, if you guys all had video on it, then I could turn my video on and we would have had a way better live stream. I didn't realize everyone had the video on. Oh, my God, that's my video. <laughs> that all is right. right. Yeah. Hi, Russell. Tell Hi, John. Good say goodnight. Oh, goodnight. It's good night. Good to see you. It's good to see you. Good to see you. I <laughs> see you, Russell. Mm -hmm. Hi, Volt. <laughs> Gosh, now we all have faces off, then. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen the debate. I saw like a lot of tweets from it from like the tech Marxist crowd and they were like, Peterson, he professes to like, he, he made it like from the Marxist perspective, it was like uh, Peterson's got his status from being a critique of Marxism. And yet all he read was a communist manifesto and he only read it recently. But I watched the intro to the, the debate and then that wasn't what Peterson said at all. He just said he read them when he was 18, all the works, and then he revised reading the Communist Manifesto. So it seemed like the, the tech masters kind of read into the event what they wanted to see rather than what 
what was actually discussed. But besides that little intro thing, uh, I didn't watch much of it uh, at all because I, I kind of like skipped through it and I read like the summary from like the YouTube comments and there was just like, I don't know, I kind of had shared Tyler's sentiment there. So I, I, this is going to be you and uh, John and Voltaire <laughs> kind of kicking off that, uh, you know, leading this discussion there and I'll probably tune right. out a little bit more while I get yeah. to do some, do some other things, yep. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I definitely say I, I was underwhelmed, I guess. I, I'm not sure what I was really expecting because I wasn't too familiar with Zizek, but having been familiar with uh, Peterson, all of his talking points were very familiar with, to me. And so there was not much uh, really there. What I, what I guess was surprising was just how non-confrontational the entire kind of debate was just because like both Peterson and Zizek seemed to share like a strong... I guess, way of look, almost like this, a bit of pessimism to towards the idealization that like Zizek is kind of pessimistic towards the, uh, the, the idea, the idealism of the left and Marxism, even though he calls himself a Marxist. A and Peterson is kind of uh, a little bit, I, I, I guess, kind of the same way where, I don't know. There, there's definitely a shared like anti-political uh, cor correctness between them, and, and so yeah, there wasn't really much to for them to disagree on. And I think that's where some like some of the Marxists I, I've been following have kind of been upset with Zizek for not like owning <laughs> Jordan Peterson in, in that moment. Yeah. So th what it is is like you were saying before. We're we're expecting like the ghost of each ideology to inhabit the the person on the stage. So we're expecting Zizek to like rear up in this, like wield the communist manifesto like a sword and smack Peterson across the cheek. And then we're expecting Peterson to stand up for the, the free loving, free speech, capitalist. Uh, Liberalism. Yeah, yeah, capital right. Liberalism. Yeah. And that's... <laughs> yeah. And it and instead of them like going at it and like one of them conquering the other, it was more so <laughs> going at it and, and discovering that both of them were like two sides of the same coin. And they, I don't know, it, it was somewhat, I guess, I guess optimistic being able to see that there are these certain fields where, where the, not even feels there are certain shared values and goals that both Zizek and Peterson had and shared ideas even uh, to a, a certain extent, it just in like how they both frame happiness as not being an end unto itself, but rather a byproduct to a meaningful life or, or a life within a story of some sort. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I was sort of optimistic to see that there are ways in which two agreeable people on far ends of the different spe uh, ideological spectrums can actually be able to share a, a, a conversation and certain agreements with. It, but it might also be a bit of a, I guess, pessimistic look at or maybe a nail in the coffin towards the whole debate format. Because there is, I think this has kind of been seen uh, kind of in the underbelly for a while, realizing just how utterly fruitless these types of public debates and pu debate forums are actually for that, anything. It depends on what YouTube algorithm stream you happen to be uh, swimming in lately. Okay? Oh, yeah? Because, it, yeah, you can step outside of it and you can inhabit the stream of the the, the morning kumite that was associated with the, uh, um, oh, well, what's his name? <clears throat> I'm so bad with names, but it, there, there are, there's a, there's a whole new movement turning point being led by Charlie Kirk and oh, Candace yeah. Owens, you know, Candace Owens. And this is actually a great <laughs> juxtaposition to the Peter Zizek uh, argument. There's, um, there is, the reason why there wasn't a great debate on stage had nothing to do with capitalism and communism. It had to do with the fact that they were just two old men. 
and that Zizek could not summon the energy and passion of youth, which is what really lends fire to most ideologies, right? It's not the fact that the ideology drives you to do the thing, it's that you are utilizing the passion of youth formed into the mold of that particular ideology. And Zizek doesn't have that anymore. He's an old, jaded, cynical bastard that happens to rant about what he sees. Right? Like, <laughs> and so you're not getting communism, you're getting Zizek. And that yeah. is the, that's what's so funny about it. You're not getting communism, you're getting Zizek. And that's <laughs> Peterson's argument uh, bar none displayed on the stage uh, as a as an example it's about individuality it isn't about the ghost of communism it's about the individual you see on the stage it's about zizek it's <laughs> about what blossomed as zizek what makes zizek interesting is not communism but his mannerism his, his ability to hold your attention even though he's such a crazy idiosyncratic creature like that's what's and very amazing. incoherent <laughs> right? Like that is his beauty, let's say. That's what makes him attractive, despite whatever ideology he happens to hold at the moment. When he was 20, I'm sure he was as diehard a communist as Peterson. Right? It's be, just the way my, my take on Bate, uh, I thought the openings were terrible, but <laughs> how it was evolving like to a more casual conversation, that was a really good moment. Because it's, it shows that you can have two public intellectuals to have a very casual conversation, a very casual manner, and they also and they this allow for the ability for them to talk about what they're into. They're both into uh, psychoanalysis and psychology. They're both into that. And at the end, Peterson himself was kind of uptight, but at the end of the conversation, he appears to be genuinely enjoying himself. He appears that he likes Zizek. He likes his uh, his brand, his sense of humor, his personality. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, uh, that's the. I think the main message of the debate at the at the end of the day is that you can have these conversations even if you disagree with each other on a more deeper level, but you can agree with each other on more pragmatic and superficial level on the state of the world the state of man and the, and their discontent with the modern world or their discontent with their lives and how they're living their lives it's just they, there's so much agreement with that um spear space that nuance I, I wonder how much it really is to do with like their like personality of like the big five in in, in like their oh, agreeableness uh, study carl young though mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But, like, I, I've seen some of the other, like, videos of uh, Zizek trying to, like, disagree with different people. Or, like, uh, like he has certain disagreements with, like, Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins or things like that. And, well, no, those uh, people you, are disagreeable and dumb, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I, I, I wonder if that's, like, the main distinction between this debate and most of the other debates that you might see online. Because, like, for... Dawkins and Hitchens and uh, Harris, uh, they are, it seems like they, they're high in disagreeableness. And so very like hard fast to their, their ways of thinking about things. Uh, whereas both Zizek and Peterson are very, I guess, more open to these types of ideas being, being and actually playing around with them rather than uh, some of the uh, other ways. But I don't know, I, I still feel like I, whenever watching these types of debates, I, I, I kind of end up questioning, like, what to what end is this occurring? Like, what, how, what, what manifests from this in, in the world because of this event here? And I don't know. Maybe th this I, isn't this, isn't it obvious, man? Doesn't it? Do, do mo don't most of these things seem obvious? I feel like we cover them in shades of complexity and nuance because we want things to be sophisticated right but it seems so obvious sometimes like like that's what i mean it seems very much like a spectator sport mm -hmm. when you when you just if mm -hmm. i were to pick anyone out of the crowd at a peterson conversation or event and ask them like probing questions about their philosophy and what they believed or didn't believe i'm sure i could find half a dozen contradictions i could probably find half a dozen in my own set of beliefs not, none of us are whole rational creatures that confine ourselves to like these uh, ultra pure righteous lives. Like, 
it's just it, it's like we we like even in these conversations like what are we doing in this conversation right now right that like there are shades of things right there there is a yearning for truth that maybe each of us has to varying degrees right there's a desire to not approach certain topics let's say there are cultural taboos that we have remnants of perhaps there are language issues certain words that we feel comfortable using on youtube or not or there are all these things that constrain the way in which we express ourselves that are in some sense indefinable and have nothing to do with these highly uh, systematized flag bearing like banners is what they are they're just banners you say i am a communist and that's how you identify that you're part of a group that's how you that's how you insert yourself in and gain resources of the of the group right like if you're a young troubled person and you've been rejected by your culture to gain the resources of another group all you have to do to, to go to antifa is just go to them and say hey i hate the white male patriarchy right now you've got you've got a new family and that's mm -hmm. it you've raised the banner and it's as simple as that and, and i think that's what's going on it's as simple as that but then we start elaborating all these crazy ideas right the, the complexity of capitalism and communism and the complexity of libertarian ideals and even this very technical argument about how to that's going on in chat here about how to uh, corral the various uh, interactions that are occurring in the twitter sphere uh, like these these feelings of being constrained it's like like to go back to the jungle metaphor, I'm a lizard that wants to climb the Twitter tree, but other people are saying, no, don't, you can't go on the Twitter tree. Right. And no. the, the question is, do you, should you go on the Twitter tree? Maybe that's not even a tree you should inhabit. Maybe the insects that are delicious to you are on another tree. And maybe you should just let that tree be and let the insects and lizards that live on it be and let them be. Maybe you should let California be. Man, you really don't like California. <laughs> no, I love California. I, I, I have people there that I love, individuals that I love, people that I know now. I have uh, whole, there are whole sectors of society that I love, but they're a great example. They're a, they're a, they're a scapegoat. So. <laughs> okay, so maybe my, maybe I'm like placing too much of my own high normal. expectations. Huh? What was that, Ben? Oh, microphone's on. I was just telling uh, that oh, one. <laughs> okay. So, 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 if I'm getting part of your point, then maybe I'm placing too much expectation on like there's supposed to be some sort of end uh, or achievement through this interaction between Zizek and Peterson. Like, there were achievement. Okay. Uh, oh uh, well, like the the event itself was the achievement, perhaps. Like maybe maybe I'm I, I should be thinking. Let's, about let's this. check the bank accounts in the pocketbooks of the organizers <laughs> and and let's find out. Right, let's find out. <laughs> well, okay. So let let me finish my point. Like maybe I, I'm looking at this like it is some sort of uh, political move or something like that. When maybe it's more of a sport move, like. What we observed was a basketball game, but oh, instead of playing with a basketball, it was playing with ideas. But like my point earlier, it's never pure. The motives and intents are never pure. The, the oceans and streams that we swim in are not pure currents. You, when you go in the ocean, you think you're in like the ocean, but you're not. You're actually in a million different currents that are the combined different chaotic directions of a million different tails of fish and a million different tugs from Saturn and the, the, the like the, the moon and like crazy things are going on in the ocean that are all part of its texture, let's say. And the same thing is true in our own life, right? So like I said, you and I are here as partially to discover truth through conversation, but also we want to say something witty, right? We want something to be witty, to come forth from our mouth and for people to appreciate it. So that there's a like we have natural biological mechanisms for uh, to, for recognizing when we like this. Peterson goes on about this all the time. Look at the crowd. Right. I pick somebody out. I see what their reaction is. So that I know how to do it right all the time. This is because of machinery in Peterson that is 
designed to look at faces and read emotions and then regulate his behavior and speech to that, right? It's part of the the control structures that seem to kind of innately exist that help us human beings organize ourselves in these hierarchies that he's so fond of discussing. All right, so I, I guess my what meaning or like what purpose can then maybe be overlaid onto the Zizek Peterson discussion that is relevant? Like what what is the relevancy that I can now gain from this interaction that has occurred? between the two like what can i use from this discussion for my own day-to-day -day life perhaps <laughs> one thing at least I, I see is maybe how <laughs> how there are certain uh similarities between the the communist ideology and parts of the more reactionary right ideology that have like similar uh let's say dissatisfactions with the capitalistic materialist uh way that society is currently like i know this from uh somebody on twitter and youtube uh, pragmatic culture he is much more of the fan of zizek being kind of a hegelian himself and he considers himself a uh, part of the reactionary right, which is very fascinating because like you get people like Hassan Piker, who's a uh, hard left communist and, and like a lot of the other people on Twitter that are also communists. And they're all, they were all cheering on Zizek to a certain degree. Some of them were well, like, that, yeah. Zizek is just a nobody really. But. I, that, that may be in fact, the great point that we pull from this then the practical point that the purity of intent and the purity of your ideology is absolutely an illusion. Nobody is a, a pure ideologue. And if they are, it's like, it's painfully obvious. That's Peterson's point, right? When you're confronted with somebody who's possessed by a particular ideology, it's painfully obvious and it's painfully boring and it's painful to interact with them. But mm -hmm. even Zizek is not painful to watch with all his idiosyncratic mannerisms because he's not possessed of an ideology. He's possessed of a broad, diverse range of experiences and intellectual mm -hmm. ideals right and he's played with a lot of different ideas and and that's expressive of it so i i think what what we have to understand is that there isn't an a team and a b team that we join we are a human being that has needs that need to be met if they're not being met we need to ask why what frictions right if i want to climb the twitter tree what frictions are preventing me from climbing it Right. And in some case, it's, you know, the, the Twitter boss saying you can't bring your speech here. Right. But I think that's really what we have to see that we're, we don't have to choose a team. Right. We don't have to side with this nationalism tendency. Right. To, to give it another label where we choose a team and define everyone else as other and then create a combative. Almost prophetic and destructive uh scenario right that, you although i know i don't know if it's avoidable you Sorry. should be a professional philosopher a professional philosopher <laughs> i'm a father so in some sense i am um a much better uh, job not on youtube it's like uh you know well, you're, just good at, you're at, good at monologuing like you're really good <laughs> at you know you're really good at off the cuff now mm -hmm. getting to your point yeah and connecting this is not off the cuff ideas. though See, the, the, yeah these are these are ideas that ramble around and i guess they get accessed all the time by many of us in fact right that, that's that's really this has been beautiful to watch in fact this whole process of this awakening of the conversation the purity of that motive in fact the purity of that stream is what's always drawn me to it the purity of the intent within peterson is something recognizable so when he says that he's devoted to the freedom of speech, you know, like, you know, that that is a real core belief of his, you can sense that there's a purity to it in the same way that you have like these pure intentions and these others that are kind of muddled, right? Like you're not quite sure if you are defining yourself as a good or a bad person or how you're discriminating or judging. 
but it, that that's that's ultimately what we seek. Um, there's there's this really broad conversation in the in the YouTube space regarding flow. Uh, Rebel Wisdom has brought in a couple of people now that are touching on that space. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but people like feel, uh, John Verveke. Yeah. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. feeling of flow, the which is from a human hemispherical perspective, it seems something to do with like less friction right so when your your intent in the world matches how the world actually functions in it and you don't have any hiccups you experience flow and it's a it's a profoundly gratifying experience and it, i guess it has something to do with the way the world actually is right so we can define frustration as an individual that wants to climb the Twitter tree, but cannot climb the tree. It's a desire that exists, right? It's a physical instantiation of like a magnetic impulse, uh, image of an idea here, object here, and then some hidden path between the two that must take place. That seems to be the, the, the goal of what consciousness does is it defines a path or it attempts to find a path between two points and it navigates momentum so hmm. yeah so i i guess how to bring in flow towards these types of conversations that are going on right now on youtube and right so yeah so the question is are you really experiencing friction uh, and, and how do you define flow in, in your environment, right? So uh, in, in a sports environment, someone who is a swimmer experiences flow when they're working at maximum performance, peak performance, and they've practiced and they've worked out all these motions and then they perform those motions and they function well and the electrical signals are not being interrupted by or redirected from by some frustrating event, right? And it's gratifying and it causes growth It produces hormonal uh, regulation that neurogenesis, all this wonderful, positive stuff. Um, so the, the question is, what is the environment that you inhabit, right? What, what is the, the space with which you have choices and how would you define flow within that space? So on the stage of communism and capitalism, we were expecting turbulence, not flow. We were expecting chaos, right? A clash and then some kind of resolution with a victor. Instead, we had like a weak flow. It's, it's, I wanna, it's like a weak, it's like a trickle. I wonder for this, like, does flow require circumstantial alignment or could it be a practice of mindfulness? So, for instance, like flow. Like, as you described, is things when, you know, things kind of come easy. And if there is a challenge, we know we can, you know, deal with it. Whereas it seems like we could play some mind tricks. What is it? There's a term for that. Jedi mind tricks, as Ruben says, right? Where um, we could try and look at all challenges in our life as something we could overcome and, and accomplish and then that way induce this kind of dance of flow, this kind of tiptoeing, uh, well, like this belay tiptoeing, I mean, where, um, you know, we kind of deal with adversity as if, you know, we're dodging a shield and then we'll be able to tackle it or as if it's a sign that we need to do a better path. Like Paulo Coelho's Alchemist is kind of, I guess, a little bit about how to induce flow against adversity. Right. Yeah. So I think that's actually a great point. So from a physical standpoint, the sign of turbulence is the sign of like direct opposition, let's say. Right? It's like orthogonal interactions. It's like it's perpendicular it's or head on. Right. It's it's a it's a smashing of forces. It's non flow. And that occurs. It occurs when someone yells at someone else who's quiet and meek. Right. It's, it's physical force, it's violence. It's, and I, this is actually uh, an argument taking place some tongue in cheek in the modern era where words are being interpreted as violence. And the, the truth of it is they are, 
right, to the people that it produces that triggering effect. And the, the question of whether or not it should produce that triggering effect is a, it's an ancillary one. But the fact that it does happen, um, it's still, it's physical force transmitting through the air. It's like it's making an impact, right? Um, but th that that that's it's it's everything in the universe is in a flow of energy. Right? It's all about the exchange of momentum or uh, other electromagnetic phenomenon. It's all about flow. And where we find beauty, we find regularity and cycles and flow. That seems to be how we kind of define partly view, uh, partly how we define beauty is this symmetrical flow of energy. Yeah. So I, I think you raise a good point there, Ben, in, in asking like, is, is flow like a mental like hack that we can kind of uh, like impose upon ourselves and, and, and in order to like feel that meaningfulness within our lives? Or is it something uh, that is maybe more a byproduct of our circumstances and being in the correct circumstances to bring about that flow as a byproduct? Is it something that we can uh, artificially adopt or something that is kind of outside of our own control? And, and I, I guess like where we can bring in flow so that it's not just our own mental experience, but also a, I guess, a, a meaningful in, in in objective sense. Like be, it has some sort of interaction with the our actual environment to the point that, or, or rather than just something that we, some sort of delusion that we're currently going through. Like um, uh, Peterson talks about how Dostoevsky had these uh, seizures, and just before that, he would have a hyper sense of meaningfulness for everything. Uh, and uh, uh, I knew somebody that had a uh, drug problem and he would like take a lot of rubitessin. And I think would go into these like long conversations where it felt like he was in that flow state for like two hours, just talking about all these grand ideas. And this was all like within his own experience, like super meaningful and like super it's super in that flow state whereas for anybody else that I was talking to him like okay yeah you're just really high <laughs> something like that uh so yeah like being able to i guess match our mental experience with the actual world that we exist within is kind of a goal that i at least have it in my oh, have for for myself yeah i always i no matter how abstract the concept, I now always attempt to visualize its physical presentation, hmm. right? So even like the concept of uh, of love is in fact some weird network, like a physical network that exists, and I can kind of visualize it, right? It's a thing. It has, it has presence. It exists, and you can modulate it. Right? And And that's... That's what we're always doing in conversation. We're modulating these structures. These are the actual structures. <clears throat> um, yeah. what, what were you just saying? I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, so figuring out how to, uh, I, I guess, overlay the meaningful state of experience along with the actual how I'm acting within the world. So that my I'm not gaining meaning from something that is irrelevant to my uh, towards my existence or towards the existence of my family and my broader community, things like that. Uh, but so that, yeah, bringing those two together in, into a way that isn't just like mental masturbation, something like that. Yeah. I yeah, so that, that goes back to my description of ethics before, where we all have this like conceptualization of how we should behave. It's like a mapping of the world of of how you should be good, let's say, like should be polite to other people. It's your mores. It's, it's all these pressures. And then there's the actual way in which you behave, which is kind of represented by the objective perspective that the rest of your social network sees. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you were to poll all your friends, am I a nice guy? 
<laughs> oh yeah, you're you're yeah, great, <laughs> right? So like there there's that. They're like it's a difference in in your perspective. Um yeah. So yeah. like who, who we are as a person isn't all localized with our in our own internal subjective experience, but rather like there's a lot to us that we don't even realize because there's like certain the other perspectives that have that are able to see us from a objective sense and be right. able to see like where our blind spots are even. It has something to do, I think, with the, the changing of resolution. It's a zoom effect of some kind. Uh, the conscious awareness in some sense is like a zooming effect where you have a, a low resolution view of the world as a child. That is what naivete is, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very cartoonish view of the world. And as you age, maturity allows you to recognize, to become aware of more parts of the world. And if you inhabit a world where other people can speak to you and have a different perspective, then by conversation and through polling, you can discover this kind of objective sense of yourself, right? This is another strange thing about our modern era is, is that we have not just conversation anymore, but we have an, like a, a bewildering array of technologies to view ourselves from other perspectives. Like you can take selfies and you can see your reflection in a million different mirrors and a million different windows. And like there's this whole conception of self that's always ever present now, especially in social media. It wasn't quite present pre-modernity. And, and so I think you can actually track it, a la Neumann and others, right? Like the awareness of humanity over time, the awakening of consciousness is the capacity and the potential for that exists perhaps in the machinery of each human. But just as a child becomes an adult, your own consciousness of the world around you is shaded by degrees, uh, right? It's based on where you've learned to look, what you've learned to discriminate. Because you can look out into the world and you can see green and some brown trunks, or you can read a, a botany manual and you can see ash and, uh, and, and dogwood and pine and oak and water oak, and you can start to distinguish between these things, right? And that's the change in resolution that occurs. And I think uh, a big problem right now is that the conversational space that's occurring in our hemispheres and writ large in the political spectrum is occurring at different resolutions and using different languages. Right? That's uh, like the communist capitalist argument seems to be occurring at different resolutions. Uh, will that ever end? Will the, are, are we able to move on with more enlightening topics than something that's really entry level to politics? Go. Yeah, yeah, we could. Like right now, we could. Well, I don't know. What, I don't know what else to talk about. I'm exactly, to... <laughs> exactly. the The landscape of conversation is about all the interesting things, and the interesting things, and the things that people are doing, and the things that yeah, they're fighting that's... over. And that's our arena. That's what we have to cheer for. We don't have now, to cheer for anyone, right? We you cheer. don't. That that's that's actually an option. I've. I have employed this be, option many times. We could be like that donkey from Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the in the New Testament and Revelation, John, your namesake, mm -hmm. the Revelator. Uh, so, well, yeah. So I, what what is else to talk about that is meaningful? Because I did I did enjoy myself on this um, podcast or live stream more so than the non segregator show because that was really exhausting irritating that's good well, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah uh, sorry go what, what was the non secretor show is that another podcast or something uh, the non secretor show that's a atheist podcast and uh, i went on there um i want to say nearly two days ago now mm -hmm. yeah it was, yeah it was on wednesday and um uh, uh, I talk about how religion principle formate try I tried to talk about how religious principles um formate our social, political, cultural institutions. And um, I end up talking about the founding fathers. I didn't really want to talk about America. I talk I really want to talk about Europe, but we end up discussing the founding fathers and their religiosity. You know, I try to focus focusing on how they ultimately view the Republic, civil society, and how to maintain it. 
and they sort of just went on and on about they did, although to be fair to them, they did say that one of them did say that America is not a Christian nation by, I think John Adams said that, but John Adams is a bit more complicated than that, you know? Um, We're all a bit more complicated than that. Yeah. I wish you could realize that. Like, like if we just give each other the deference of, of complications, right? And not only complications, but the potential to become more complicated, let's say, the potential to mature to uh to maneuver more effectively in an environment that we may be bumbling fools in right like yeah. that, that seems to be going on uh all the time now and like in conversations like we 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 get angry at someone for not knowing something or get angry at them for for being uh immature let's say it's it, it's like uh it's, I a, anger it's, it's a argument. lot of people with my immaturity, unfortunately. Well, it, we all have an immaturity depending on the environment that we inhabit. Let's say this is tied to something Einstein once said that each that that every you you can't judge a, a fish uh, by their ability to climb a tree, right? Like every person's a genius in their own uh, industry, in their own field of study. You, there are like it's it's kind of like this, like. Um, the ease with which you are yourself in the presence of your family, right? Versus the ease with which you are self in the presence of strangers. Hmm. What is that? What is that difference? Who are you when you're in the presence of strangers? Who are? Where Who am are I? You? Who are you? I'm, I don't know. I don't know. Is that when we identify primarily yeah. with our labels and our personas? It makes it because, easier, doesn't it? Yeah. Because that's kind of the thing. Like when I'm interacting with strangers, like just even at my workplace, I'm adopting the persona of a, like an NPC character of just somebody that's performing a task, a, a job for them. And that's the, that's the limit of who I am in that environment. But Okay, right, so you should you... introduce yourself from now on and do something like, "Hi, I'm John. I am, a, I'm a libertarian, but I have anarcho syndicalist <laughs> leanings. And I usually uh, find myself on the control end of the spectrum." And it's like, okay, that's that, that's cool. I just I just need a car wash. Okay, <laughs> <So> like, just... <laughs> okay, I'll buy the cookies. <laughs> yeah, just okay, just shut up. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I don't know. You you had mentioned something earlier that like. We don't need to use these labels at all. Like we, we don't need to raise our flags or anything like that. Like you can, it, what we, can imagine, we, imagine every conversation you ever had sans identitarianism, sans group discussions. Imagine every time you tried to use the group level pronouns and group level uh, objectification of other people. You just couldn't. You couldn't summon forth the words. Imagine you just hmm. couldn't speak about communists. Communists do this. Uh, communists do that. You just can't do it. Communists don't do this. Communists, there's no such thing as a communist. That's his ex point. Point to this postmodern neo Marxist. <laughs> there's no such thing uh -huh. as anything anyone can be pinned down to a label. Sorry. Good. Yeah. Well, the issue I take with that is it makes conversing about things that you already agree on very difficult. Because if we aren't able to use like labels for concepts, then we would have to explain the base level of those concepts all the time, in which case we can like get caught in the trees instead of the forest. Whereas like if we just say like by referring to communism, if we have a shared terminology of what that means between us, then it allows more efficient conversation. It, it, but w it, the issue with with such terms is when the speaker versus the recipient has different terms for what they are ascribing to those words. So someone may have a very different meaning to what left and right <laughs> means. And I've like for so for me, like I'm practicing what you're preaching, Tyler, for the terms left versus right, and it's very difficult because they are such scapegoat terms, but they're completely amorphous, like. They can mean whatever you want them to mean exactly. uh, to an extent, and it's just not profitable. Whereas more other terms uh, we can use where they can kind of like uh, uh, be 
very efficient tools for conversation, but it's kind of like that trap of being like clear on the terms and then being willing to to not, I don't know, make the terms uh, prescriptive by just using them as descriptive. Well, so like as Peterson often points out and, and is, as developed through our understanding and development of psychology, when you look out into the world, you can't just see it as a series of objective objects, the objective facts that are presented before you. You have to overlay some, some emotional affective scheme, right? You have to know which things to move towards and which things to move away from. And so it's like a framework that, that allows you to pay attention to only those things that matter in your resources, right? Squirrels see acorns way more clearly and with greater fidelity and resolution than I ever will. I don't give a shit about acorns, right? I don't look at acorns. But when a squirrel looks on the ground, man, it's just acorns, like a sea of acorns. But they don't see Hondas, right? They might see a hawk. Like, like that's that's the complete and utter difference of the world, that that the difference in perspective. So when, uh, oh, and by the way, I, I don't mean that we can't use common terms. I mean, when we're speaking of other people, not to use group language, group level language. So I would not discuss the behaviors of communists. I would not say the behaviors, I would not say communists behave this way, right? What this does is it, it's like saying, wildebeest behave this way as a biologist, right? Wildebeest stuck in the mud will kick violently, right? Every time they'll kick violently, trying to call for their herd. This is a behavior of wildebeest. And then you come across a wildebeest that doesn't do that. Whales swim in the sea. And then you come across one that's beached, right? Uh, mammals do not have duck bills. <laughs> and then you find the platypus. There's a million. But isn't that risking throwing out the generalization for the inclusion of the exception, which doesn't seem to be worthwhile like we can still make generalizations and acknowledge there are exceptions you can but i think what what happens and i think you have to actually there's there's an economy of language that you just can't skip out on by using that type of language but what happens is the tendency is towards this group level think one of the dangers of playing with that language is that you become lazy in your capacity for discrimination and and that is what we see that <clears throat> when the when the complexity and nuance of the political landscape is too complicated for uh, an immature mind it resorts to uh, as minimal and simplistic a worldview as it can right that that seems to be the default status is it kind of pulls back to us them like that's the default thing when the comp when the when the space is too complicated to understand <laughs> yeah, but there's still the problem where, like, as soon as you are introduced to somebody that you are is a complete stranger to you, there needs to be some sort of like quick mechanism for actually being able to understand uh, at least a low resolution version of the person. But it's, that you're but it's totally about. bogus, and you probably know this uh, as a joke. Maybe, well, maybe not. It's it's pro prominent in the South, right? It's a joke about Baptists, right? Like how do you recognize baptists on a boating trip it's like whether or not they'll drink beer in each other's presence there's variations on it right mm -hmm. so th those two baptists would meet each other and be like hey i'm john the baptist right and what does that mean so the other guy receiving that information says to himself okay great so i know this guy doesn't drink beer uh is supposed to be faithful to his wife uh, believes in Christ and you know like maybe he's got this little kind of nebulous concept of what it is to be Baptist meanwhile the other guy thinks hell yeah I tell him I'm a Baptist I get to sleep with his wife because he's gonna trust me okay that that is what's happening all the time that's what we call a wolf in sheep's clothing right mm -hmm. yeah these but are, these that, are the uh, that, that that type of like exploitation of the uh, ideological short uh, ideological heuristics it isn't something that is very effective in the long run so like <laughs> you Ask don't any parasitic okay. species in the biological ecosphere I actually, how wait, effective it is i, I know this actually from experience from like going like being interested in catholicism i have attended a couple masses and you very quickly realize there is a whole series of rituals that 
I am, you are completely unable to fake. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Being with yeah, it. that's the shibboleth. Right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is the that's the signifier that you're a real deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I mean. These, right? these identity labels, are like you know, the you know, say by saying a communist, and then they present behaviors that aren't aligned with you know our personal interpretation or an objective interpretation of what communism means. That doesn't mean like. Like and I and I, I'm not sure you're saying this right, but just to be clear, like, it doesn't mean that we should throw out communists because, like, say for instance, a Muslim, like we can say, you know, Muslim encompasses a lot. There's moderate Muslims, there's more extremist ones, uh, there's more completely uh, uh, secular ones, right? And then you know, but they still use those labels. So we can drill down on these like supersets and a subsets, and then by by having that criteria, we can then say like. John is a good Baptist, or John is a bad Baptist, right? John slept with my wife. He's a terrible Baptist. Don't trust him, right? Uh, so it allows us to use those tools to kind of like describe people's behavior in these sets, like these supersets or subsets, and then locate it otherwise. Because we need this type of trust-based relationship. When we meet a stranger, we need to know whether or not they have shared virtues, which is trust or whether or not we have to be skeptical of them or whether or not we should be ambivalent, which is we may not know. No, that's a great uh, point. And that's, that leads exactly into what John was just bringing up, that there, there are other mechanisms of verification other than, say, just the language identifier. So I can walk into a room of communists and I can say, hey, guys, I'm a communist. And they can say, oh, great, welcome, you know, like, card uh, do paying a uh, card carrying do paying right. communist awesome or they can say what's the secret handshake and i can say right oh, shit what's the secret handshake i don't but know but this actually ties on to one of the maybe a good subset of this like an underlying mover here which is that those who see most at risk of generalizing to a label where it becomes prescriptive seems to be those with uh o who are overly trusting and overly agreeable so for instance you can imagine antifa and then you go up to there and then you say hey antifa like you know blah 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 and you say those virtue signals and then they implicitly trust you because you voice those virtue signals and then you do something against it like say stephen crowder going undercover and everyone trusts them every single time Yes. And then they always exploit, like they just do the little virtue signal and then they always exploit it. Mm -hmm. And it's just surprising. Whereas like, but that's something that comes from maturity. Like as you get screwed over more in, in life, you learn to be, you know, less trusting on labels and more trusting on, on actions or deeds and, and proper actions like dignity, honor, res uh, not so much respect because that's earned, but like, dependability reliability uh, uh honesty things like that you actually see the 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 labels of behavior rather than the the vocalized uh uh descriptors of your behavior right so i i mean you're right like i the language cannot be done away with let's say entirely but the the caution the cautionary tale is that in many circumstances, in very complicated circumstances, the default position seems to be to withdraw from a nuanced perspective using that language and define it, define other people's behavior from this group perspective, from the low resolution, communists do X, right? They behave X. Postmodern neo-Marxists do this, right? They go to SJW rallies, they do that. And then when you run into a postmodern neo-Marxist that doesn't do that, your classification system is now ruined, except cognitive dissonance. And that's exactly what you see happen in the political landscape all the time. It, it, this right. is just what Zizek did on the stage. Show me the neo-Marxists. You know, where are they? You can't point them because these classification systems are just, they are, they're methods of economy in our speech. And when we attempt to behave or when we attempt to enact political structures that utilize that perspective, we run into a problem. And, and strangely enough, it's the same relationship, I think, between something like the mathematics we use in the quantum realm not working in the macro realm, right, in, in the right. general relativity realm. It's the same problem, that there are these mm -hmm. 
locuses of individual subjective experience, right? Whatever that happens to be as a human being at the quantum realm, it's the individual particle. And then there is no clear way to define, no, no. All right, let me, I, I can run with this. So for instance, veganism, right? Like this is going to be one which is, you know, one can say, okay, a vegan and then do all these prescriptive behaviors of what a vegan should do. However, when we look at the objective doctrine of veganism, which is to avoid unnecessary harm to animals, right? Then that allows a lot of sophistication in how that doctrine is practiced, right? So, uh, uh, from a unsophisticated way, we could then say that vegans don't wear leather. However, if it's secondhand leather, then you may see a vegan wearing it, in which case, you know, for the uninitiated, that could cause some dissonance. Um, so it's more seems like the battle here is trying to go from ambiguous uh, descriptors into more concrete and scientific ones where, where and to then measure our sophistication of how that behavior is enacted. Yes, yes, it's it's prescriptive versus descriptive, exactly. Like it's speciation as it occurs in real time throughout evolution, right? Like if you were to, this is this is exactly what's happening in the uh, environmentalist movement, by the way. They've defined morality as like the way things are right now, right? So any increase in CO2 is therefore like deviating from the morally correct value of the way the earth should be for the way things are right now. But they don't give a shit about the dinosaurs that died out, right? We're not yeah. up in arms about the change in the atmospheric conditions for other animals, right? But we define the way things are now. So it's a very narrow perspective. It's very strange. But things are always changing. Language categories are always changing. The words that we use now are dramatically different than the modern or the, the Middle English that was spoken, the Old English before that, the uh, Romantic languages that uh, cr were created from the, the, the Roman Empire. Like all of that stuff morphs over time, new species, right? And so, yes, veganism is like a parent idea that, if allowed, can have offspring ideas, right? And you see one leather, no leather offspring this way, and you see like another, you know, fish, no fish offspring this way. And the battle of which species is allowed to live, which is adaptive to the environment, is part of the conversation that's taking place you know, right now, like the words that we use, like where we argue about whether mm. or not you should eat fish, right? It's the creation right. of these new species and the culling of them, deciding which one should live and which should die. Yeah. It's the stewardship well, it's a species term here, I think like, you know, to use a more controversial, but probably a more accurate term, we're talking about race, which is a shed of shared culture and behavior. And in which case, uh, we can then see why progressives and communists kind of resist against that notion of race, which is this kind of desire for a, a one unified race, because they kind of throw out, to some extent, like the contradictory and there's different, like this is again, an example of just what you talked about when I use communists there, right? Which is, you know, there's a whole breadth, but there is, you know, people who kind of use like, like, you know, like the gender uh, discussion as well. It's like, like, you know, are the transgenders switching to a binary gender or is gender just a purely a social construct? In which case, well, why don't they, the, the gender dysphoria people just socially construct themselves in a different way if it's socially constructed? Um, and there's a whole complex of arguments and I'm not taking any sides, uh, at least in that one minute segment of what I just talked about. But the point here is- uh, uh, Well, I, so I'd like to- I like to I like to take these uh, these highly charged arguments and try to envision them in just a slightly different metaphor to to maybe divorce them from the emotional context, perhaps like you can envision male female as like instead of just human beings and other biological organisms as a world filled with like uh, bolts, right? You have a bolt and you have a nut and the bolt goes into the nut, right? And they reproduce that way, let's say, right? But then one day you have uh, a bolt that doesn't fit any of the other nuts. And the argument among all the bolts in the nuts is going to be, is it proper to be this newly shaped bolt? 
and, and that that is what's going on all the time, right? Like, but people uh, uh, assign these highly charged moralistic frameworks from the past related to notions of being damned, uh, of being associated with hellfire, of uh, of shame, and and they construct these these language games that try to protect them from an environment that they think is dangerous, right? They try yeah. to, they're trying to build a jungle in a way that won't harm them. Yeah. All right. I, I, I got to jump off and, and go do some other things, but otherwise I, I would definitely stay. Uh, if Voltaire's there, are you, are you there, Voltaire? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's good to meet you. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, thanks for the compliments <laughs> as well. Uh, just a little uh, outro before I go is, yeah, like, so these are the Beverly uh, discussions. So we start off as, uh, at least these discussions start off as, like, JBP discussion groups. But, like, we weren't as eloquent as, as we were when we started. And it's, like, three having these discussions every week for two years or more now, uh, you know, we've got a lot better. And, and that's, like, really the value that, I you know, I've gotten out of the group and, why it's been running it for so long and, and it's good to hear that you know john john did decide to do this on on the beverage channel and and have you part of it but our, our discussions for the future will be more book oriented we've recently taken like a bit of a break from the weekly meeting so i'll resume in june and i'll get back to more book focused things and then also some general discussions about economics uh soon and more philosophy things. So all the descriptions about it is at meet.beverly.me or you can find a discussion form at discuss.beverly.me. But yeah, it was great to meet you and you guys can continue the conversation. And sorry for talking so much when when the show was, was you know, to, to kind of discuss your viewpoints. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Thanks, It's man. fine. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Bye. See you, man. Yeah. So exit okay. stage left. <laughs> so we recognize that okay, that these labels have heuristic utility in that they give a simplified resolutional framework for just to interact with another person. Of course, that's the thing. It, so when we're interacting with people that do not share our framework, this is the, the heuristic or the label itself serves as a divider between the two people. So like Peterson was going up against Zizek expecting this Marxist, I guess, ideologue or, or like that's why he thought it was relevant, I guess, to even bring up the the communist manifesto because that's like the whole preparation seemed like he was expecting to go against a marxist and then by the like the the rest of the discussion is him discovering oh so sex not really like all these other marxists that i know so like his mental framework of a marxist like zizek did not fit that mold at all it, it was something else so like heuristic heuristics serve a purpose for having some sort of shared group identity something like that that we can quickly trust somebody else just based off their mannerisms or the the label that they proclaim about themselves i, I can get a and and of course this is a uh a, a technology that can be exploited by somebody that's clever enough and, and knowledgeable enough of the, the the like background information for this um for for this heuristic but okay so yeah i i guess that's the best the question then is like when to apply a heuristic and when to dissolve it so i guess like in the in why well, i would say you can't escape it you you're uh -huh. you you are always applying a heuristic your very existence yeah. is like biologically defined heuristics that are within a sea of crazy amounts of information, infrared wavelengths, neutrinos, uh, you know, the full broad spectrum from the sun, uh, like uh, who knows, like galactic yeah. particles, crazy information, wavelengths passing. You're this tiny little narrow perspective, right? Just a, just a few wavelengths 
in the Roy G. Biv range. Uh, just a few uh, between like 10 and 20,000 Hertz and like, like just a arrow range of experience. And then within that, you're limited even further by the frameworks that are created by the, the combined ancestral choices of all your genetic past, right? So the, the presence or exodus of a particular environment by any species produces a change on the environment and the species, right? It's never, it's, it's always, it's, it's quid pro quo. It's never one-sided. It's always this strange, weird amalgam. Yeah. And that's what I mean by no pure motives too. We, we do these heuristical lower resolution simplifications all the time because we have to. That's the way that we do the economy of language, right? It allows us to speed up. It changes the pace of things. That's what's so phenomenal about our current times right now is the pace of change is accelerating. Hmm. There's this force in the universe that drives towards novelty, let's say. Right? And this is why, by the way, that communism or centralized control can never work. Because the very moment that you solidify a particular environment, you create an adaptive niche where complications are taken advantage of by the strongest, which then directly manipulates the environment to make it more successful for that species, right? So you will see this in human beings. When they become good at something, they'll make it so that they, they can become even better at that thing. And then they'll teach other people to become better at that thing. And then that whole thing gets better and better, right? Like the process of running, right? The ability to break a four minute mile was the collective combined efforts of runners working together over time. And it's a strange thing, but the, the whole history of genetic past is essentially that it's this weird creation of the organism and its shape. Like I have five fingers and I have a humanoid simian appearance, right? Because of all of these divisions over time of choices that organisms made chordata, vertebrata, like all the way down the phylogenetic tree choices being made to inhabit or not inhabit various environments. It's so strange, right? And so here we are now, and the environments that we're discussing are primarily these networks within our neocortex. They're, they're not trees that we're climbing. They are neural networks in our neocortex that we're arguing over. <laughs> it's so strange, right? But real, nonetheless real. And, and that's what I mean by it being somewhat of a spectator sport. It's like a we have the machinery underneath that exists because of the drama of our past genetic history and all the choices that we need to make in order to navigate it successfully. And it just doesn't disappear overnight. It persists. It has momentum, right? An object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an equal or opposite force. Like that's the, the physics, the underlying physics of change itself. And so things persist. Our biology persists. That was Nietzsche's point. It persists. All of these highfalutin concepts that philosophers come up with, all these darling brain childs that they develop, all these well-defined structures that we want to control the world with, it doesn't matter. The moment you do it, some new environment gets created and novelty arises. New speciation occurs. Things change to become better. It's fascinating. That's the history of our universe, it seems. But that's what's occurring. So that's why, com that's that's for me, why total centralized control, the, the pure and idealized concept of what communism is and this, the ghost of Marx, right? That's why I think it can never work. It has to be this weird balance between, it's the tug of war between the, the yin and the yang. See, why can't they have this conversation on the stage? Right? Why can't we talk about what really matters? It's funny. I would, I would comment, but uh, these things are kind of going over my head, or I don't know how to, you know, get my own perspective on this because I haven't given this much thought. 
since my focus is mostly on politics and economics. What is your brain producing? What what's what is it uh, what is it blooming with on the inside? Just thinking. You seem like you have a serene mind. What do you does mean? That, does that sound right? What do you mean by that? Serene. I don't know. Like it. Like plat. Like like your natural contemplative. State. Yeah. Like like you would like your yeah like you would like to sit beside a lake and ponder it. I, like I that. think just. I, I'm always thinking about pace, um, like in conversation, right? When you're like, we're having conversation now. Uh, and, and Ben's always worried about this too, like engaging people in conversation, trying to get involvement and making sure that the time is equal. I never really pay attention to this thing. It just ideas come and they either squeeze out or they don't. But but it's, it has something to do with uh, with pace. Like you say, you haven't given much thought or uh, your mind has not been led down these paths, but um, flow and conversation, right? It's about what does your brain produce well, right? What is it for, right? Like a, like a flower, like when you go out in the back, like I have a magnolia tree in the backyard, its flower is designed to accomplish certain things, right? It produces certain results. And each brain and each human seems to be kind of like that. It's just phenomenally more complex and diverse. And I like, I feel like we've gotten to this point socially where everybody's so afraid to express themselves all the time because of this weird, uh, that's part of the true underlying argument of the SJWs. It seems the threat of truth that won't let it fade away is that we're always so self-conscious about who we are as we express ourselves socially. And so worried about how people will receive us, what thoughts they'll have. And then we let like whole rooms of people like, infest our minds with what perspectives they may be having. I, I am well versed with social anxiety myself. So I'm, I, I speak from some <laughs> experience, but that's, uh, it, Just, it seems prevalent in our social media at times. We're living in the world of data and people want to be objectively correct 100% of the time. Yeah. And since we ha live in the world of instant information and our um, what is available to us now, just basically through a Google search. Yeah, why didn't you Google this? Let me Google that for you. Mm -hmm. Right, We even have a website for it. Let me Google that for you. So um, <laughs> just yeah. people are afraid to be wrong, but when they know that they're right about something, they tend to be absolute about it. So, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they're always that subject that they want to comment on, but unsure about it because they know someone, they just don't want to be seen like a fool. And a lot of times in this modern world, people don't suffer no fools. And my often at time in my own life, I am a fool. So, oh, I'm such a fool. I'm such you're a, fool. a father. You have no real excuse to be a fool. Um, Fatherhood shows you how much of a fool you are. Strangely enough, it's the the thing that uh, that you are least prepared for, and most surprised by. I've discovered, um, and yet it is the most natural thing in the world. It's uh, we've made it unnatural in our environment now. I think we've made it uh, unnatural. What well, made it difficult? I think. There's a reactionary critique of liberalism and about they made everything about the individual. And um, with this focus on this individual, it's ironically tend to um, reduce them as cogs, economic beings, economic actors, but neglects the spiritual reality of man neglects our our I sense hope. of duty, our honor, our sense of tradition. Like it's just basically it's basically a critique that liberalism through its economic lens of the world to reduce reduce it to accrue the materialism 
<laughs> like a reduced man to a crude material, to a crude economic man, you know? It, it, it's so funny because, like, when uh, I, I read the Communist Manifesto, I could see how that almost, like, reactionary argument against capitalism was right there within it. Like, there's this element of uh, Marx critiquing, uh, expressing how capitalism defines man down to only his economic utility and no. like even brings in like uh women as well and like by like the like the unstated telos behind the capitalistic market is to bring in all viable workers towards producing value producing economic value that is and so, like, it, it destroys the, the family structure and it, it, it just, it, 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 it treats man as a very, like, low resolution version of himself that is only seeking after economic uh, needs. But keep in mind, Marx hmm? since come to those arrows, you know, like, that's the same reactionary critique of Marx because he did the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. he has a much better grasp but uh, what was going on, but he also did the same thing. He committed the same fallacies, the same errors of thinking of man. Mm -hmm. Like, just, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the reactionary view of the reactionary critique of liberalism and Marxism is that they ba they basically view it as an anti human philosophy in many sense in many aspects that they are against a capitalist a capitalist worldview altogether and mm -hmm. they ultimately prefer a more esoteric spirituality of man and what ultimately drives man's action their motivation and often not, it's not about economic incentives. It's more about what they perceive to be important, which is often as faith. Mm -hmm. and, and for and people who are sustained by faith, they seem to have their seem to seem to have a certain immor immortality that they always seem to survive and overcome themselves and their environment, their adversity. And I think that's the, I think that's the um, one of the main components of being a human being, being part of something greater than yourself, being part of a certain faith. That's why I think Christianity or religion will not disappear from the face of the earth. It's, it's, it's just going to be always a part of us because you're always going to look for motivation to keep mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah. He who has a why can bear almost anyhow. So and I'm still a poor talker. No no, no. you're conveying your points very well there. Uh yeah. That, maybe that is at least one recognition that can be gained from both this conversation between Zizek and Peterson, but also like the 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 further conversations besides that is being able to recognize where it is that uh, reactionary thought has has shared goals and values and uh, like beliefs in the inherent dignity of a, of human beings besides their economic utility uh, between both reactionary thought and kind of the more Marxist or communistic uh, people that are out there as well. And like, um, I don't well, know. If, so if I can insert the perspective argument again, mm -hmm. some people, some people do in fact want to be wheels or cogs in a machine. Some people prefer that. These are the hyper industrial, hyper conservative mindsets, right? Some people like, like that. What type Chinese of Chinese people though? seem to kind of like that. It seems politically mm -hmm. the, they prefer the more collectivist mentality, let's say state-run centralized government then there is the uh, the other segment of the other end of the spectrum right these hyper anarchist individuals that want no control there's this broad range 
and it doesn't seem to be a single system that can contain them, perhaps, right? It's like trying to find a single set of mathematical equations for the quantum and the relativistic realms. It, you just, when you introduce personal choice or randomness, let's call it, or noise in the realm of McLuhan and communication, you end up with these kind of fundamental perspectives that can't be avoided. Uh, and and that is, that's the big argument that's always taking place right now is how to, how to deal with that noise, how to deal with the disagreements, the fundamentally different perspectives. Are they compatible? I, I wonder, <clears throat> so like the stem cells that became my liver could have become anything, right? Do you think they're pissed off that they became a liver instead of like a neuron in the brain or some other part of the body? Do you think that uh, a software developer in Silicon Valley is pissed off that he didn't become a farmer in Iowa? Do you think a steel worker is pissed off that they're not a lawyer? It happens. Right? Yeah, I, I think what usually brings about that sense of di uh, discontentment discontent, uh, is through the recognition that there are others that had that had greater opportunities given to them and, and then that they were able to maximize and then benefit to a much greater degree than they themselves have been able to. So that's the, uh, like the, the, the Matthew effect the principle that Peterson talks about where the rich get richer and the poor just end up looking up at them and with, Frustration. Well, the, the traditional argument for the capitalist communist, uh, or the, let's say the laissez-faire free market, laissez-faire free market uh, capitalism is something like, or let's say in this move to Adam Smith, the invisible hand, all that, right? Um, the market's defined by the desires and purchases of people, right? Uh, wares that are being offered, and then the desires of the people purchasing those wares. So if you create something that the market desires, people will buy it. And that's how you know that it's something that should be in the market, let's say. Right? And then the price will be defined by supply and demand. Um, it should balance out. Right? You can do the whole curve analysis, all that, right? Hmm. Well, okay, so here's an interesting thing I was thinking about. Like, <laughs> there is a problem that, we, that can occur where we attribute, like, the intentionality of the actor based upon the outcome that it produces when in fact it produces multiple outcomes and we're only looking at one specific one when let's say the intention was actually this side one that is maybe unseen through the, the lens that we're looking at so like you can say that the lawyer his attempt is to become the best lawyer out there and that's like what what guides him what causes him to work his ass off when in fact it could be let's say biological drives towards rising up the the competence hierarchy of other sexually uh se sexual prospective men out there so that they could be a ha, ha, a, a, a person very high in the uh, the competence hierarchy that would be uh uh sexually attractive to uh many other females out there just based upon their high income and also their high status and things like that. And so this is a side intentionality, let's say, for uh, that is using only the like the the uh, market system of law in order to achieve that end. And so though it's attempting to maximize his status as a uh, sexually available uh, person uh, out, out there in the market of, say, sexual selection through that biological driver mechanism that's causing him to do that. He's also producing a secondary outcome of, let's say, a high cost for um, law, uh, being able, uh, a high cost for 
getting legal representation. Different, that, that's like a secondary outcome due to this first uh, pr or, or primary causation behind his uh, intentionality. And so yeah, you're, you're touching on the chaos of these complicated systems. It just can't be measured. That, that's fundamentally why we have such diminish, diminished views of the world, because to attempt to see all of the information before us, it's, it's too much. It mm -hmm. make and so like you can say that there's the unseen hand of capitalist uh, economics that is driving up value towards what is most necessary for the uh, people in, in that uh, nation when in fact it could be instead value is like economic value is built up for unnecessary fields that are only useful for let's say gaining high amounts of income for those people just so that they are more sexually viable like yeah. uh, say like the stock market something like that that like it produces value towards the rest of the the uh, businesses and things like that as a side effect but it, it it still is devoting so many like available men that could be used for other means towards this realm that is only useful for all right in a group of friends yeah. group of boys the loud person who's highly extroverted and energetic who's really good at baseball will always stand up and say to the group guys let's play baseball <laughs> let's play baseball it's awesome let's go do it and if there isn't sufficient resistance the group will go and play baseball do you ever see the sandlot right mm -hmm. Well, she watches great, great old feel good movie, right? Um, it, yeah, it, I mean, this is just the way that kind of the world works. That Peterson points this out, though. This is another argument from the, the market thing. It's like someone has a good idea, they stand up, I say, I have a good idea, right? And they try to share it with the world. If it's a good idea, people recognize it and they go move towards it, and seek it out, mm -hmm. right? I think that is what, in fact, leads towards historically what ended up being the feudal relationship right it's it's someone saying i have land i have a great idea i have a product come to me i will give it to you yeah. right in exchange for something but i i guess just to i maybe bring a point against peterson's hierarchy or competence hierarchy argument is that there are multiple variants of competence hierarchies. There is the pornography competence hierarchy. There is the journalism uh, competence hierarchy. There is uh, the... The internet bandwidth competency hierarchy. <laughs> I keep on messing. It's a historical problem from your location. So can we just label this as the agency problem? It is the agency problem. Absolutely. It's, that's the constellation of, that's the way I see it anyhow. So I agree with you. If that's the constellation of problems we're dealing with. This is the agency problem. So it's always the one. We can always, can always overcome this because there's just simply incompetent people in the world. And we all or have. Or sometimes an asteroid smashes into Earth and kills the dinosaurs, right? And we always have our own particular set of skills. And I will find you. <laughs> I, I'm 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 gonna get I'm gonna guess that that was a taken reference. Yes. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I can meme hard, man. So, um. So. Okay. Right, so yeah, yeah. There's the agency problem then, where each of us are seeking after our own. Uh, let's say maximization for our self-interest and at, yeah. by doing so we can be there can be end results that are a net negative towards the rest of humanity uh, but yet still maximally beneficial towards ourselves uh, so yeah how <laughs> how to deal with that dilemma then with the i guess with the free market at play
All right. So to go back to the flow state, mm -hmm. the flow state is associated with a lack of a sense of self. Strangely enough, you kind of lose a sense of self and you kind of inhabit the activity, whatever you're engaged in. This is no longer Heidegger's uh, design, right? Where you lose all sense of objective reality and are just like one with the environment and the tool that you're using. Yeah, maybe I, I, yeah, it, it, it's that has shades of, of similar meaning. I think Dasein was used more broadly, but okay. uh, yeah, but yeah, something like that, right? Um, so flow state in in regards to free markets and the individual. Yeah, but did, did you just we just went? I just went. I know. Down. Sorry, <laughs> kind of Dasein uh, alleyway, man. Okay. Um, okay. No, no, no. Okay. So flow states. The, essentially, all right. So there's this, there seems to be this weird force. It's tied to the yin yang creative destructive elements, let's say, that builds up the sense of consciousness, which is awareness of a choice space. It's something like that. Awareness of the ability to change something, right? Mm -hmm. And then also the capacity to program something to take care of that choice in perpetuity and so to give an example when you're a child uh and you get angry for the first time your your dad comes to you and he says son everybody gets angry count to 10. okay if you count to 10 the anger mm -hmm. will subside and you will not do something stupid it's this rule that you've learned how to modulate your behavior yeah, that's something interesting is like by adopting rules, it gives you a greater freedom for dealing with your own limitations. So it's like the uh, Jocko Wilnick saying discipline equals freedom. And I, this is something I noticed for myself, like for the month of May, I've decided to like completely go off fast food. And so like that's no longer something like tempting me anymore because yeah, yeah. it's not it's no longer an option. It's just right. So when I, you when you your choice space for food right? You used to have 15 other fast food restaurants, you know, just chop mm -hmm. them off. It's, they're gone, right? Now your choice space is much smaller. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that it dramatically alters your environment, your landscape. It is the environment that you move in. And now you've subtly altered the shape of John, right? The shape of the particular species of John. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is kind of out there. like how I see group based morality structures that they are this, like, we're adopting this inhibiting doctrine or dogma for what we are going to allow ourselves to believe or act out. And this is what's going to, this is how we will develop ourselves as, uh, like, to the greatest amount of human flourishing that we can achieve through this adoption and this practice. And we're going to uh, exercise let's say social shaming or other mechanisms to ensure that this dogma uh, does not uh, or this, uh, this doctrine does not become desacralized and just thrown away so that people can let, let, like say for marriage, something like that, where you adopt the principle that till death do us part. And so this is a, an adoption of a limitation upon yourself with and a lot of the times we like i don't know we forget that this is something that we've adopted ourselves so like i, I think human rights are something similar to this where human rights only really exist within a group that accepts those rights as a given for everyone within that group like it's not like human rights exist out in the wild where there's lions and tigers and bears. It's just like oranges only exist in orange orchards in an or mm -hmm. on an orange tree, right? It's the exact same thing. Human rights are the, are the fruit, the fruitful product, the fruitful offspring of human behavior, just like oranges are the fruitful offspring of orange behavior. Yeah. And oranges can either be produced by the tree or not. And we can either have human rights or not. We can wither and die or grow and produce fruit. Yeah. And so I think, uh, I don't know, one of the problems with maybe such a high degree of 
liberalism uh, or uh, libertarianism is the removal of all inhibitions upon ourselves other than the most vague and kind of um, meaningless or it's not meaningless like the nap is a perfectly fine uh moral doctrine to adopt uh and, and the similar ones akin to that uh but without having the i guess more inhibitory uh substructures that you might get from like religion or from ideologies uh different things like that or these other types of meta narratives for ourselves is it leaves one just kind of aimless and in a sea of meaningless oh it's not necessarily meaninglessness but a a, a a sense of aimlessness where you're unsure you're there's all these multiple options for where to go but no directing pathway towards any singular one there's nothing that is held up as being a valuable goal towards achieving rather there are all these goals and none of them particularly seen as useful towards the people that with within your social group and i think that's also a problem with libertarianism is it's they don't exist as a super organism or as a social group so much as individuals and so like when you're an individual and you have no ideas like what the people like i don't know I, it seems like a lot of times people are just trying to please the people that they interact with and like make them happy somehow by doing things that they think will make them happy uh and, and i'm using happy and maybe too crass for okay but look 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 whoa, 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 see this is what's so strange about the the looking glass right alice in wonderland so you're defining it from like all of the people outside of the the retinal mirror, like the realm outside of the self, right? The collective experience of all those biological species and that you interact with, human beings, animals alike, cats, dogs, all that, right? But inside you, this is the great Jungian insight, when you go the other way through the glass, those all exist internally as well. Little representations of creatures and beings inside you that have resource now, right? Like once you've created the instantiation of that physical network, it now requires blood and nutrients to survive. The memory of it, the existence of it in your short term memory, all of it is a resource drain. And that's what the Dunbar limit's about, right? It's a kind of economical average of, of how much actual resource nutrients your brain is willing to devote to these other representations of human beings that you have to empathically associate with mm -hmm. and and so that like in a marketplace you could have let's let's say you're in france you're you're uh, on some uh street somewhere in marketplace and you make the best croissant right it's lovely it's beautiful everyone comes to buy your croissant and then some dude across the street starts making the best baguettes like just you gotta die for them, right? and then everyone stops buying your croissant now this guy didn't do anything to you directly he's not competing with you directly right but he has now harmed your livelihood your strategy for survival the environment that you operate in is now altered by his presence it wasn't even a direct competition let's say mm -hmm. how do you deal with that right that that's part of this <clears throat> this broader conversation of, I think it's actually one of the elements that really is unresolved is um, in economics and they, they turn it externalities, those actions that are the byproducts that you have no real control over and that may, as they spin off from your system, interact in the broader marketplace in crazy ways that you have no clue about. Mm -hmm. right? like, like wanting sneakers in America produces uh, underage sneaker factories in, in Indonesia, right? By Nike at some point. It's an externality that was unforeseen by the people just desiring sneakers. Hmm. And so that's like still a dilemma, I guess, mm -hmm. except for when the individuals within that free market have adopted these types of inhibitions towards allowing this to occur. So like, um, like in, in a completely monogamous society, 
the competence hierarchy for divorce lawyers is something that would naturally kind of go down just because there's nobody getting divorced. But of course, in a society that we have currently where it's perfectly acceptable socially to do things like that, then uh, yeah, there there's a, a, a market to exploit uh, th through the practice of being a div divorce lawyer or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's define creatures as something which takes in a resource and outputs a waste product of some kind. Right. And that waste product can be highly diverse. It can be like pro social waste product or, uh, maybe a con of some kind. Right. So lawyers, um, provider resource to the marketplace, right? And that is something like divorce services, say in the family law realm, mm -hmm. right? That's a service that they offer. It's a waste product. They take in energy and their waste product, the behaviors produces divorces. Right? That's, that's strange. And it seems that environments are defined by, or well-functioning environments are defined by balances in the exchange of these resources. So you have you have a series of layered uh, autotrophs, um, uh, like in heterotrophs. You have a series of layered. What are those? Uh, oh, oh, so the uh, so you have the the plants which produce food, and then you have those things which each eat the plants. Right? They okay. can't produce their own food. Mm. So it's uh, producing your own food versus not producing mm. your own food. <laughs> and. Then you have things which need to break other things down you, to produce the cycle, right? You have to have uh, a, a capacity to recycle, right? That's that's what we determine. So, if you look historically, there were there was a period in time where the bacteria needed to break down the cellulose of trees it didn't exist yet, and so you have the, the the continual layering of trees that wouldn't break down, they wouldn't biodegrade, they just sat there and for. Who knows thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years they just built up and then we had massive fires and the remnants of that are deep buried underground and have turned into natural gases and all sorts of fun things for us now but um yeah so to define a well-functioning ecosystem you have to have Essentially, what we know is something to translate this, the, the energy that comes from the sun into a food source of some kind, something which eats that, and then a whole, like a whole system of things that eat those things, right? And then something which decomposes those things so that they can be recycled and made into new bits. And you have to have these elements in order to have a well-functioning ecosystem. Right. If you, if you don't have anything to biodegrade, you can't recycle, you can't build new things. You have, to, you have to be able to break down and build new things. This is, in fact, the two yin and yang forces uh, expressed in evolution. Those forces which build up, the autotrophs and heterotrophs, which kind of break down and build up at the same time. And then those forces which kind of tear down so that they can be used and recycled. That's what keeps the wheel spinning, let's say. But we need, in our circumstance right now, to be able to define in any given uh, environment, any marketplace, be it the biological realm or the marketplace of ideas, say for attorneys or the economy in the United States, the service market, we need to be able to define a waste product, something that's produced. We need to be able to define a resource that's consumed by that entity, be it a lawyer or a teacher or a, a fireman or whatever. And then we need to be able to, to recognize whether or not those things are functioning well in their ecosystem, right? So when you introduce rabbits to Australia, they produce some crazy unintended effect. And you say, oh, rabbits should not be in Australia. It's easy to see, right? When you have too many divorce attorneys in the United States and your, <laughs> your divorce rates skyrocket, right? Well, it's like when you find a bunch of rabbit poop after introducing a bunch of rabbits to Australia, it's no wonder you don't question the resource waste produced by the rabbits. Oh, of course, we have a bunch of rabbits. Of course, we're going to have a bunch of rabbit poop. Mm -hmm. If you have a bunch of divorce attorneys, you're going to have a bunch of divorces. Like it, when we recognize, I think this, uh, this uh, perspective, 
And we see all of these niches in the ecological space of our social structures. Uh, I think that's when we start to see where the turbulence lies and where the flow lies, right? You start to understand what are actual resource drains and what are fruitful, productive parts of society. And that's where the, I think where the most productive part of our conversation should be, which, you know, you and I did a lot of this work too, which roles in society matter? How do you find out what your role is? How do you find out what it is that your talents should be doing? Not from the perspective of some industrial machine that's like molding you and forming you to fit the little niche that they want you in so that you can pull the lever and spit out the latest iPhone. But some weird combination of the inner impelling force, the subjective experience, whatever that is, and the feedback that you get from the environment, right? The feedback that tells you, it's almost like putting a glove on, you know, like, is, is the glove form fitting? Is it, if you have a glove and you put it on, does it fit your hand well or is it too large, right? Are the fingers too long? Is the thumb too short? Your body, your abstract self, is like the hand and the glove is the little niche that you fit in society and you can tell whether or not it's a tight fit right you can mm. tell not whether or not somebody cares for you whether or not you're wrapped in like a a nice leather driving glove or whether or whether or not somebody is society feels like you're some hmm. and do you think that the flow state is maybe an indication of that fitting Yes, and I think the flow state is defined by um, the natural, well-worn niche in ecology, right? So when you have the, the optimum number of divorce attorneys for the optimum number of divorces, it's the same thing as having the optimum number of rabbits or the optimum number of kangaroos in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's something like that. And you can tell based on the turbulence that surrounds that industry and something like that. Hmm. Okay. And, and do you think that the flow state can also be hijacked through other mechanisms? Like uh, for Becky talks about how a lot of young men feel, get that flow state from playing video games. Do you think it's an, I guess an indication of, against society that young men are not experiencing this flow state in the real world and thus are having to in instead get it from like digital means. Well, that and the language of the real world, there's no such thing as a non real world, right? That's what, it, right. <clears throat> like it's just a new world. Let's call it a new world versus an old world. Yeah. It's a digital landscape. It's a digital environment, but it's a physical one too. It's just distributed mm -hmm. in a very strange way. But if you go back to being a baby, when you came into this world as a conscious creature, you don't remember it, let's say. But the first time you saw a tree, you were like, what? What? What is that thing? First time you saw a dog, you're like, what is that thing? What strange form uh, matter has taken, right? Like that. that's the, it's, uh, it's a very, it's strange for us to be surprised by the way nature is, but it, it does happen. We're, we're right, we're, we're continuously amazed by the strange forms that nature takes, let's say. Uh, it seems natural to us over time, but only after time, right? You're used to seeing trees, but truly they're strange. You're used to seeing human beings, but let me tell you, from the perspective of an Alpha Centaurian, they're very strange, right? Like we get so limited in our little narrow perspective. But yeah, flow is defined by this, uh, this, state of less friction, right? Like, we, so even when you're searching for words, like I was just doing now, there's a sense of a thing I want to say. I'm, I'm my, my conscious self is like, it's like right in front of, it's like a magnetic pull, right? Mm -hmm. I'm pulling resources from my brain, searching for this thing. I have an intent. And I'm waiting for words and ideas to catch up to that. And if it matches 
somewhat the ideas that that were pulling on it i'm like okay that's it and the words come forth out of my mouth in a flow right if it doesn't match it's it, it, uh, 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 it's a stutter mm -hmm. it's and this this process is is best felt doing a, something like that or or learning to row well or participating in a lot of uh, bodily movements uh, mm -hmm. martial arts of any kind sports of any kind music right but it occurs at other paces too. So there's a pace of speech and there's a pace of being a lawyer, right? And you can have the flow of being a lawyer. These are people who are ecologically adapted to the, the niche of a lawyer, right? People who score high on the LSAT exam, people who do well in the three grueling years of law school, right? People who like the clerk or Supreme Court. It's like, oh, these are all niches. And if you fit it, you become a very successful lawyer. If you don't fit it, you drop out in second or a year and you become uh, an economist or a, uh, an accountant. Or a teacher at law school. <laughs> <laughs> There's a joke in law school about that, actually. Um, that the people who make, well, I'm probably going to tell it incorrectly. I never went to law school, but I, I have these strange little snippets of memory of other industries. That, um, the uh, the people who make C's or B's become like your your regular attorneys, and then the guys who made A's or, or B's uh, become your uh, your uh, law judges, and then the guys who make A's become your professors or something. Maybe I have that backwards. Either way, it's very funny when told by an attorney. <laughs> I'm sure um, where, where they can apply the proper nuance. So, uh, and I feel bad. So, sorry, vote for not bringing you in at all for this uh, like do you have i don't know oh, fine hey. <laughs> anything you you'd like to add or i don't know nothing no, nothing real to add what would you like to talk about though um, nothing really just just learning observing like i normally do talk to people on the internet See, there. Hanging out the side of the lake, watching the waves lap slowly on the shore. And uh, talk to people, talk to left wing people, anarchist people, transgender people. I talk to all kinds of people on the Twitter. Social media is a very wonderful thing because you can talk all kinds of people and get their perspective. And you get That's to learn cool. from them, you get to understand them, and you might get friends. And if you're lucky, you can make friends with them. Meet have them you, have them. you made friends on Twitter? Yeah, a few. That, that's actually them. a positive data point I, that I haven't heard much. Yeah, <laughs> Tyler's kind of our resident anti-Twitter <laughs> person on here. Am I resident for that? I I don't know. I need, I need a plaque or a title or something then. So. <laughs> Anti-Twitter emeritus, perhaps. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to hold that position. See, it, it, it really depends on how you're using Twitter. Because, like, I see so much that there is the, the drama of Twitter where people are only using Twitter just so as to, uh, like, tear down others for being idiots, <laughs> basically. And using the idiots of the people that they interact with as fodder for their own, like, Twitter timeline. Like, mm -hmm. they'll get into this long conversation. Like, I, I see this a lot just because within my circles, watching the Christians versus atheist debates that go on on Twitter. And like, they'll be the atheists that talk to the uh, young earth creationists and, and, and then like, they'll say something stupid and then they'll post that up on their timeline. It's like, look at how idiotic this guy is. Like this idiot. Uh, and, and then the same kind of thing for, on, on the Christian side as well. They'll find the lowest hanging <laughs> atheists out there that just have like no real understanding of philosophy or theology or anything like that. And then they'll get into some sort of conversation and then they'll just post that up on their timeline. It's, that is where I see the, the supreme downfalls for Twitter, because that's the thing with, <laughs> with Twitter, those types of activities are highly rewarding <laughs> for your audience because that's exactly what they like to see. Listen, the lioness goes out and catches the weakest gazelle, right? So do you uh, know 
like godless cranium uh yeah yeah he, he's mostly active on twitter isn't he like he, he doesn't do many videos it seems like anymore yeah and you see and i think what you describe describe his account mm -hmm. <laughs> i've described quite a few accounts all under the same uh because yeah there's a lot especially within the atheist and also the christian community there's a few like christian accounts that that's primarily why they use twitter uh, and same for the atheists. That's like primarily why so, uh, use Twitter. How will you describe my account? Your account. Oof. Mm. You're you are one of the few accounts that actually like posts as much as you can for the things you're reading. That's what I, I, I like about seeing the stuff that you do on your account because you're you're like making your education into a shared experience for the rest of us. So like you'll go through a book find something that you like and, and put it up for, for us to see and, or quotes that you have, things like that. It, it, it's making uh, education, your, it's making your own education sort of a communal experience for some, which is very, very cool to see on, on Twitter. I don't, I don't see the, the toxic kind of uh, it, us versus them mentality at all within how you use Twitter. So you get the well. If that's good, uh, I mean, if that's the case, then then kudos. Um, yeah, help help reshape the landscape. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually uh, I've got to run off. I got to. Oh yeah. Go to bed. Uh, it's been a great <laughs> conversation. It was good to meet you, Fult. Good to see you, John. Mm -hmm. Nice seeing you, Tyler. Yeah, yeah. We can wrap up here. It's, it seems like a good time. Well, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't mean to curtail your own conversation. I just have to bow out. So. Okay. Yeah. Sure thing. Bye, Tyler. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> That's something I've noticed with Twitter. And, like, it's frustrating because I, I like, I, I used to kind of go about that, that practice on Twitter as well. Because like, it's very fun to, to go about dunking on atheists uh, on Twitter, especially, like, you see how they use the similar types of arguments. So all, all it requires is certain, certain, cer uh, certain responses to those require uh, those arguments, and then kind of just. But I don't know. I, I don't see the. Okay. Yeah, I, I I just see it as always incentivizing the wrong type of outcomes. I think. Even though it does, like, if you have a high Christian fan base uh, or audience base, and then you post this type of th thing up on there, like, look at this idiot. That That's something that your entire fan base or, or audience base will really enjoy and get a lot out of it. And, and you can use that to grow your fan base as well, because, like, similar people to that will be gravitated towards your content just because you have that capability well just like what we were talking about with peterson and zizek like the marxists go after zizek because they want to see him defeat the uh <laughs> the the alt-right uh darling jordan peterson <laughs> and the uh yeah the status quo warriors <laughs> uh want to see the peterson go after the uh marxist Delusional utopian that is Zizek. He's a romantic in some ways. Zizek? Yeah. 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 I think that's kind of where there's a another bit of shared um, property to both of them is kind of romantic, uh, especially like in their conversation when they were talking about uh, Jesus on the cross. Like there's kind of this shared, almost like secular perspective of religion that they both enjoy when, uh jesus became an atheist and <laughs> yeah that's why god has forsaken me i thought that was beautiful mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. when the when jesus story is more of a allegory to god's suffering than our own mm. suffering you know so yeah he had mentioned that's from i guess gk chesterton i haven't read any chesterton aside from um the one story about the anarchists uh this something about thursday 
Uh, yeah, but anyway, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, it, Zizek is quite the interesting guy, especially when talking about religion, because like he he he's he's not like Peterson, who's kind of cagey about his religious beliefs, or he, it, who, Peterson's kind of like an agnostic that that is unwilling to kind of put himself into either camp, whereas. Zizek seems like firm in his stance of atheism, but is still <laughs> like, despite his atheism, adopts a pseudo Christianity uh, as, I guess, just as a life principle or uh, as a meta narrative to adopt due to its, uh, I guess, benefits. I don't know. It's fascinating. It's fascinating that the year we live in, it, where we. <laughs> Through secularity, we can get a very new perspective on religiosity. There's a lot of different, like, new niches popping up for that exact thing, which is interesting because it's it's a valuable resource for both the secular as well as the religious. Yeah. Just, you said he's a bit more Nietzsche and Zizek than uh, Jordan Peterson, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'd say so, because I guess if, because Nietzsche kind of disregards the modernist framework, and I don't know, Peterson is a little bit, well, <sighs> I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know enough of, about Zizek, but that is, that is what um, Pragmatic Culture said on Twitter, he was saying that between uh, Peterson and Z uh, Zizek. Zizek was more of a Nietzschean who was also like a Nietzschean Christian, sort of, despite being an atheist, uh, accepts <laughs> Christianity as a like in uh, as a false narrative to adopt, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, just just, well, they're both men with interesting perspectives, and and as that guy said, they're both old men, and yeah, and probably is a. When I see the athe when I think of the atheist community, they're so intellectually stagnant, and I just find that to be almost um boring. Like when you watch these videos, they they get so repetitive. Like they make the same talking point and they get rather condescending because they think they're opposed of something that's hold back to humanity but our evolution our tradition our morality ultimately comes from a religious metaphysical basis our foundation comes from religion more often or not our tradition our rules or institutions mm -hmm. and if it really was harmful as they say it was <laughs> And uh, I think history is the other side there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, there's a lot to, uh, like, I, I'm quite I, I, enjoying the, like, different uh, evolutionary biologists, who, who their takes on religion. And some of them, bring, like, uh, Jonathan Haidt kind of uh, has a theory of, oh, Jonathan Haidt, as well as, like, David Song Wilson has the kind of ideas that, the uh, religious uh, sentimentality, oh, or yeah, religions are kind of these evolutionary adaptations to our environments, and, and also th they provide a yeah, like a necessary aspect to living in groups and being able to cooperate with each other in in these types of groups. There has to be some sort of shared common values be, between them uh, and like you can try to replace it through secular means like ideological uh, or just ethics things like that uh, but I don't know it, it seems like they quickly start becoming more religious like what you can see with the uh, the grievance studies and evergreen and uh, social justice activism there's a almost a spiritual nature that it comes up 
from that. Like it's a highly moralistic philosophy that they have, but it, it's also something more, <laughs> it's more rigid than like any sort of scientific theory or something like that. So it's, it, it's something that they've placed uh, such a high degree of identity with in the same way that with a religion, like there's the, the, the doctrines and the dogmas that you adopt for your religion. And these are your standpoints that you, you hold off of. And so it's not like these are scientific theories that can just be dismissed once a new one comes in. These are something that uh, a great deal of history has been built upon. Uh, yeah, you can't just dismiss it like it was, I don't know, something without a great amount of value placed upon it. But, yeah. mm -hmm. That's, um, so, yeah, did I already told you I was block, uh, blocked by Godless Cranium? Uh, <laughs> seems like... Uh, I don't know. Did you mention it on Twitter? Yeah. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Was it for? I know. He, I I think he, he was like going up against. I don't know. I know there was a whole kind of fiasco with the online atheists with the uh, King Crocoduck as well as rationality rules and uh, Steve McRae. Was it something to do with that? No, it was like uh, he was. I thought he made like a stupid point about against new. About this new stoic guy. Oh yeah, and, I know him. And I told him that's not how mafia works, and he told me that's a how ass night it was, and um, just he was getting he was getting tired of me because uh, I'm not to me. I think I think in his perspective, I'm a very tiresome guy to deal with because I'm not really an effective communicator on Twitter, or he just disagrees with me. Or I just disagree with him. I think he just grows tired of that. But with him, like, if you just check out his account when he get extremely confrontational with these people that he obediently disagrees with, he tends to get, like, really caustic. He can't, tends to get really toxic. Like, really, not really so irritated. Well, he does get irritated, but so, but he gets so high and mighty mm -hmm. saying, like, how these people can have these wrong opinions on these subjects. And uh, it gets so condescending mm -hmm. you know like he's a very condescending person because um you know since he's fighting against the bad ideas that how it's uh you know harming people but it's more complicated than that our problems our social complexities are always more complicated than that we can't just reduce these things to just one single source of evil that's mm -hmm. not that's not a good thing that's a terrible thing to do it yeah it limits you is when there's like a wide variety of explanations, why there's certain habits and um, habits and cultural traditions we tend to follow and we tend to mimic unconsciously or consciously. Just like there's always more to just religion just than just like, um, just than the fact they're anti-gay. I don't even care that they're anti-gay. I don't, I don't really care, but just I don't I don't oppose religion on the basis that they are they are against progressivism or against the liberal um the liberal set of mind like that they're against the LGBT rights or they're against uh, they're anti gay or others or other bigoted or discrimination type of thing. I don't care about that. That's their if they mm -hmm. say if they justify that in their religious that they're opposed against this lifestyle, I don't really care. That's their prerogative. It, yeah. At the end of the day, it's like, end of the day, at the end of the day, it's really God judgment to, to do with these people. And yeah. I think they're, I think they're a case can be made. They either misinterpreting what they read in the Bible or justifying their bigotry, their presupposed bigotry against them. These things, but. Yeah, there's this, I don't know, what I find hilarious about the, I guess, atheist community online is their, I guess, is the <laughs> reemergence of flat earth here in 2019. 
and that how one's flat Earth. I know, and, and like this is the biggest uh, like resource now for the online atheist community. Like this is their bread and butter, really, and yet. It, I think it's just an example of the atheist online atheist community, just how inept they're actually being. Because like they're doing nothing to to change people's minds at all. Like if their attempt is to make uh, as many people believe the true things rather than false things, and like flat Earth is their biggest priority right now, just because it's prevalent right now in 2019 then they're going at it the exact wrong way. Just because, like, you make fun of people, they're automatically going to not listen to you. Just because, like, that's basic human nature. Like, I'm not going to... I'm not going to lend credence or uh, interpret you in good faith if you're just going to be somebody that's an asshole online towards me. But. Yeah, and I, th I th these these changes that might like come up from uh, like adaptations to the current environment that we live in. These aren't going to be coming from the outside, like forced onto the people in these religions, things like that. Like um, I, I think they have to be coming up from within because those are the when we have a shared value system, that is when we can have actual conversations, I think, because otherwise there's always the hidden incentive to misinterpret you. Like if you and I are disagreeing with each other, I have my fan base that is wanting me to destroy you. And so I can take the most uncharitable reading of what you're saying and then spit it out there against you in order to make you look like a fool. And then that just like creates a negative feedback loop between us so that there's, there's no, it, it's anti logos. There's no actual truth trying to be emerged through this interaction. If that's what's going on. And it, it seems like the only times that we can reach that point is when we do have some sort of shared ethic, shared values, shared culture, something behind us to, so that I can be incentivized to change my mind in real time and you can be incentivized to change your mind in real time. And through that discussion or dialogue or whatever, we can reach something that benefits both of us. It seems like most of these online debates and things like that, there's nothing like that that's underneath it. And so like, like to me, it's no, no surprise at all that they just end up kind of going nowhere. I mean, like, I don't know. Yeah. Just That's my thoughts on it, at least. Just like there's always more to philosophy, religion, than these complex social problems. Like there's different angles and perspectives. Mm -hmm. Just they just offer one all the time, which is uh, progressivism. Steve, you know, like, you know, basically they basically present a, like a Steve Pinker, almost riggish view <laughs> on these problems. Like, like saying, oh, my, they might as well say, oh, my God. It's 2019. Oh my God. This is yeah. current year. Oh my yeah. God. We should be seeing the triumph of reason. That reason <laughs> will prevail. Yeah. Reason will prevail. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. And someone will say in the background, this is why the democracy fails. Do you get, the, you know, where I'm getting that from? Um, it sounds familiar, but I'm not. Sure, exactly what it is. Always sunny from Philadelphia when they oh. say reason will prevail. <laughs> reason will prevail. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just, there's just, there's just always more to these things. Just, yeah. Yeah, it's funny with Stephen Pinker as well because, like, he wrote his book, the the, the blank slate, uh, I, I think sometime in the nineties, uh, like. I think so, early 2000s. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, and, and then, like, it seemed like it was... It, it propagated itself in, like, the online intellectual sphere with, like, Sargon of Akkad and the Armored Skeptic, those types of people online. And I think that's, like, the furthest it actually 
went out from there because like despite him writing this like 500 page tome about how the blank slate is all a myth like despite all that the there there was still this huge amount uh, there was still this huge hmm, ideology that uh, accepted the tabula rosa premise and it's like no, no matter doesn't even matter that he wrote this book at all because the end outcome was still there's still these uh the blank slaters really and so uh, there's uh i guess like a part of his afterward or forward uh, i can't remember which that he talks about like <clears throat> my book now is just as relevant today as it was when i first wrote it and like it kind of brings up like this sure the book was successful and, and a bestseller or something like that but it, if his goal was to uh change people's minds about the blank slate uh, like the blank slate is just a myth then he, he failed at that because like within our academic communities this is the a prevalent myth that is widely accepted um so it, 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 it it's really interesting to see like the stated intentions behind uh like why people do things like say it an atheist channel it, their intentions are to get people to believe as many true things as possible and as many false things as or, or with, without as many false things as they can but yet they go about it in such a way that is just diminishing of the people that they're responding to and not actually attempting to understand the arguments or anything in, under good faith or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I see. Maybe I'm just kind of like becoming pessimistic towards the the actual utility of the internet because it it just t tends to bring about uh, uh, these I don't know clashes uh, between each other that just leads to further division amongst us. People can. People are always gonna. Following disagreements, even the littlest of things, mm -hmm. but that's always how things been been. You know how things are. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But I guess how we approach it is probably in a really unhealthy manner. Like earlier, you brought up Socrates and how he teaches students mm -hmm. that it's more of a journey. Mm -hmm. But now we're just kind of in the battle who has the more accurate information and and this leads into this rather unproductive environment that we're seeing on the internet when you're seeing these laymen debating these books. Um, like, we can disagree, but maybe how we're approaching it is wrong. Maybe we, can we just, you know, just view this as a journey mm -hmm. that we're both like this is still both a learning experience than just saying like this guy will always have all the facts all the time. Like this uh, idea that log facts and logic will win. That's not, that's not, that's a bad way. That's a bad framing. That's just uh, dealing with bias and um, shaming amongst a, a bunch of schoolgirl tactic tactics. When you frame it that way, like facts and logic will win out, but yeah, because you believe that you have all of the facts and the logic on your side. And there's yeah. nothing like you're going through a teaching process. Like, okay, I've got all the the facts and logic and you've got all you've got the lack of all the facts and logic. And so it's my job to give you all of the stuff I know so that you now become more like me. There's no dialogic dialogical process like with uh, Socrates or Hegel or anything like that. It's like a one-to-one -one interaction where one has all the information and they're just trying to like duplicate that information into the other person. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a, a great conversation, Paul. I, I'm glad you're here for this and being able to go into this. I'm sorry that uh, we kind of went on off onto a lot of different kind of funny trails and different like, 
diversions and different things like that. But that's kind of like <laughs> how most of our conversations are actually. So you get, got a good glimpse of that, I guess. But, okay. <laughs> but yeah, th thanks for joining uh, all of us. And um, yeah, this, is, this has been a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, sometime if, if you want to join it in again at any time or something like that, we can uh, set something up. So Okay. Bye, John. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> bye everybody who's listening how long have we been up for two hours now all right cool i will uh turn off the stream and if, i don't know if, if you want to ha hang back uh we can talk a little bit more give me one second